The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Welcome to the Cinematography Podcast, Episode 9. I'm Ilya Friedman, President of Hot Rod Cameras. I'm Ben Rock, President of Me. <laughs> ben, thank you for uh, joining us today with uh, all the busy, busy, busy... I think last time uh, anyone who's been listening to the podcast realized uh, I explained how you were working all the time. You were working like a... You were working... I was uh, unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately kind of having to juggle sometimes three jobs within the same week. It was it was pretty rough, uh, rough, rough waters, very uh, demanding. But, you know, the deal is if I agree to do a job, then when I'm talking to that person, obviously I'm there 150 percent for them. And uh, you are there then zero for the podcast. Although I have to say you have done a very good job about getting this next episode, the one that we're talking about right now, out quickly. So we'll get to uh, that soon. Yeah, we're about, we're about to get there. So let's dive right in. Uh, on today's show, we have a interview with uh, someone that you and I both know, a very talented cinematographer named Bill Totolo. Very talented cinematographer and director. That's right. Director as well. I, then- I love talking to people who do both of those jobs because I feel like... There's a, there are a lot like one day we should get Steven Soderbergh. If we're lucky, we'll get Steven Soderbergh or somebody like him on here because I want to know like guys like him, guys like Peter Hyams, how do they direct and DP at the same time? How do you bifurcate your brain like that? Our first interview, Jason Wingrove, he's a director DP as well. Maybe it's because of the horcruxes. I, I don't know. I have to split their their soul to be able to, you know, direct and to... I don't know what that is. You, is oh, is wow. that some Harry Potter shit? <laughs> shit, I just went to Harry Potter and you couldn't follow me. Damn it. Sorry. You didn't, didn't see the movies, didn't read the books. You have, just... you have kids. I started reading the first Harry Potter book when it was super hot. And about halfway through, I was like, I'm a grown man reading a children's book. And uh, I don't, I don't, I feel a little uncomfortable about this. And then I went and saw the first movie and I'm like, hmm, yeah, it's a kid's movie. Don't like it. Then everyone was like, oh, no, the third one, the, the Alfonso Cuaron one, the Prisoner of Azkaban. No, you got to see that. When that one came out, it's darker, it's grittier, it's more real. And I went and saw it, and it was like, I liked the cinematography better, but I thought it's still a fucking kid's book. Good for kids. They have books. I would love it when, when kids read. Uh, this is not made for me. Well, I'll tell you, it is a little bit darker than like the Berenstain Bears. So, you know, uh, I got to say that my seven year old's into it now. So it, 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 it's, <laughs> it's, it's better. It's better for me. Uh, it's better for me than reading Berenstain Bears. Darker than Dora the Explorer. <laughs> Dora is not dark in any way. So. <laughs> OK, so Dora the Explorer, the dark continent. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I I could go to another level, but only the other people listening with kids would would understand the joke. So I'm just going to completely refrain and not, and not go there. And I'm not one of them, so, so yeah, it'd be, it'd be wasted. But okay. I can tell dog jokes all day. So Bill Totolo, great interview on the on the podcast today. Really, really glad. We I'm very excited. I actually met Bill doing this interview, and he and I have kind of become friends. And we uh, share stuff on uh, on Facebook. And when he's working on a film or something, he'll show it to me, or, and vice versa. Bill's good with Facebook that way. He posts a lot of stuff. He gets early access to gear and, you know, he, he shoots a lot of interesting things. I know he, he's going to talk a bit about the documentary, the crazy Burning Man documentary yeah. that he was involved. He's involved Nutty. in a lot of documentaries, but yeah, that one, that's a whole story. Kind of itself. a, kind of a cinematography, uh, gadfly, if you will. Like he kind of, he kind of plays around in one little realm and then kind of takes a little time off and shows up in another world and. Like he, he kind of gets like the sampler platter of doing different cinematography things. You think it'd be offensive? You think he'll be offended? No, if I call not, him a not, I don't, I, no, I think that I don't uh, mean, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. He, here's what I, uh, here's what I love about Bill and his cinematography. Whatever type of project he's doing, he wants to make it the best it can possibly be. Clearly. He, he wants to like, it doesn't matter if it's a really basic interview. It doesn't matter what the situation is. He's looking for the art. He's looking for, he, he's really great to work with. I've worked with him on a couple of, a couple of projects now over the years. And that guy is always trying to find the best he can make, whatever it is at that moment. And that and that's really commendable because you, when you work with another camera person is like, yeah, it's fine. Let's just shoot. Yeah. You get the, the impression talking to him that he is a true artist. 
And uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to blow anything, but I'll, I'll just give you just to give people a little bit of a preview of what he talks about. He talks about uh, in analyzing any given scene, there is the said, the unsaid and the unsayable. That is totally Bill. I think that that's fascinating. And now it's like I'm going back and looking at, at everything I've done. and been like, oh, OK, well, how do I show the unsaid? How do I show the unsayable? So it's 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 exciting when we talk to somebody who like brings a new concept that I think you know, like the, is there a direct way to show the unsaid? Nee, there isn't a direct way, but it's like, if you're, if it's on your radar and you're thinking about it, then you're thinking about those things. And those are the things that make cinematography more interesting. I agree. And if you can't answer those questions, maybe you ought to spend some more time with, with what you're working on. I've never answered those questions in my life, but I will from now on. Yeah. But, but now you can go back and you can go like, Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. I can answer those questions based on, based on this or based on that. Uh, also on the show, uh, Roberto Schaefer, Roberto Schaefer's war story. So. Yeah. Yeah. Roberto Schaefer. He's, uh, he's, he's the first of hopefully lots of big dog cinematographers we're going to get on here who work on giant Hollywood mega budget blockbuster movies he's also our second asc uh cinematographer behind uh, chris coleman who was also yeah. great back in episode number two and uh yes i know we have a couple other people sort of lined up so that should be happening very shortly Woo-hoo. all right so Ilya, we've got the uh, academy awards coming up and uh, we wanted to talk about the uh best cinematography academy award nominees so who are they real quick okay so uh the nominees for this year's oscars are uh Ed Lockman for Carol. Didn't see it. <laughs> uh, Hateful Eight, Robert Richardson. Saw it. Mad Max, Fury Road, John Seal. Saw it twice in the theater. The Revenant, Emmanuel Lubinsky. Definitely saw it. And Sicario, Roger Deakins. Saw that as well. So do you think this is Roger Deakins' year? You know, he's been a bridesmaid now more times than most people can count and still has not, you know, gone away with the pudding. Can I can I tell you, I have... Uh, I. I I have always been very aware of when I'm watching a Roger Deakins shot film, even going back to like the Shawshank Redemption. Uh, and I was unaware that Roger Deakins shot Sicario until I was looking at the nominees. Uh, Sicario is, is gorgeous. Uh, it's uh, suspenseful. It's stressful. I do not think he's going to win. I think Emmanuel Lubezki is going to win for the Revenant. Although I have not seen Carol. Uh, I'm probably going to have to agree that the smart money's on Chivo again to win. Uh, you know, he won last year for Birdman. Yeah. But then also the Revenant won at the ASC Awards just a week ago and the BAFTAs. So, I mean, he's already on a real roll with that. So, yeah, I, I expect that. Well, you know, yeah. And Deacons is no one's going to say Deacons isn't one of the best. Amazing. L- love his work. And I and I do find him to be kind of a chameleon, although it's interesting that uh, when the Coen brothers didn't work with him, they didn't work with him on two movies. One was Burn After Reading, which I believe was shot by Emmanuel Lebesky, if I'm not mistaken. It could very well be. And then uh, Inside Lewin Davis, which is a gorgeous film sure that is. the Coens did, was shot by Bruno Del Bonnell. Also, um, what was the movie... What was their first movie? Uh, oh, well, Blood Simple. Their Blood. first three movies were uh, uh, were uh, Barry Sonnenfeld. That's correct, Barry Sonnenfeld. But there's something so special about the the combination of Deacons and the Coen Brothers. But Sicario, I didn't, I, I, it, I, I hate to say it, it's it's brilliantly, perfectly done. But I, I feel like it didn't. It's not like it brought something special. Whereas, um, when you watch uh, The Revenant. In my opinion, anyway, you know, like Lubezki's been working with Terrence Malick. You see that in there. Like you, 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 you see Children of Men in there and you see Birdman in there and you see all these other movies that he shot in there uh, in, in such a fascinating way. And also, I think that you can't um, you can't underestimate the sweat act that um, that the Revenant is. And by sweat act, uh, sweat act is uh, like in vaudeville when a performer would go out and dance and sing and do everything. And then they were just covered with sweat to get big applause. You look at the Revenant and it's like, you can tell how fucking hard that movie was to make that. There was nothing easy about making that movie. Yeah. I, I, like I, like I mentioned a minute ago, it seems to be the odds on favorite. I, I don't know what Vegas is, is putting it at, but uh, <laughs> it definitely seems like uh, Chivo's on a roll. And I, I expect he'll probably he'll probably win this as well. It is I, gorgeous. And, I, and, you know, this is by no means takes anything away from a, the other nominees. You know, it's, uh, you know, Bob Richardson with, uh, with Hateful Eight. I love Hateful Eight. I think Hateful Eight looks gorgeous. I love the 70 millimeter, uh, you know. That, that, that super Panavision 70. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Amazing anamorphic 
fun. You know, it's, it's, it's a great look. Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong with it. I just think the Rev- the Revenant is one of those movies where they had to basically chase the snow around the world so that they could shoot for like an hour and a half of a day for like nine months. And they were shooting, I think up until like October, or November, like they were shooting right up until almost when the movie came out, I think. And I knew that going in. And so it's kind of got this heaven's gate slash water world stank on it before I even sit down to watch it. <laughs> and then I watch it and I was completely engrossed. I was, I was completely engrossed and surprised and I thought it was beautiful and I ate up every second of it. You know, uh, I have to say though, looking at the nominees, I think that my favorite this year might be Mad Max. I think John Seal did an amazing job. That is a visual movie. Through Holy through. crap. Yeah, that is a visual movie. And it is a, a plot driven story that like uh, uh, on an epic scale. And when you when you watch the trailer for that movie in black and white, which is, I guess, how the, you know, John Seal reveals that it was the intention was to, to do it in black and white. It's like it looks so spectacular. I really can't wait for the Blu-ray to be released with the with the black and white version of that movie. I will eagerly yeah. eagerly uh, the moment i get my hands on it i'm going to watch that it's going to be my, my friend janelle who's an editor at variety i uh, invited me to i went to two different q a's with george miller about it and got and i was lucky enough to meet him and he's like the nicest humblest coolest guy hmm. and and I, it's like i'm sitting there talking <laughs> talking to him and uh and just thinking about like what this guy has done to filmmaking. When I was in film school, what and I told him this actually. When I was in film school, m- one of my teachers showed us sequences from Mad Max to study on how you construct an action sequence. And uh, you know, I, he he kind of laughed it off. Like you can tell he's a very humble guy. But it's like that guy rewrote the textbook on how to make that kind of movie with Mad Max Fury Road. And he, and the fact that that movie ended up being Oscar nominated. And the, I mean, like, it's just it's so gorgeous. It's so beautiful to look at. It's so well made. It, it's so exactly what I wanted it to be and what most most fans wanted it to be. God, I, th- I think that there's almost like an aesthetic that is coming out of Australia and Australia cinema, Australian cinematographers in particular. Mm-hmm. Like when I look at the works of like, you know, uh, you know. Moulin Rouge and, you know, Don McAlpine and like other like just visceral, visceral work that's coming out of Australia right now. And uh, I, you know, if, if I had my druthers, I think I might I, I would if I was voting, I'd probably give them vote for for John for this one. Was, well, and you hear stories too. like do you read the American cinematographer article about it? No. Didn't, well, didn't like, it. OK, so like for the day for night stuff that they shot he on the Alexa, this is just like this blows your mind that he was able to, that this is what he wanted to do and that it worked as well as it did. Uh, they intentionally underexposed the Alexa, you know, whereas the conventional wisdom oh, I is, heard about this. Yeah, yeah. I heard about this, like five stops or something, something yeah. really, really serious. insane. Yeah. yeah. And the conventional wisdom of course is shoot it flat and then grade, get it to where you want in no, the no. grade. He was, he, he was a baller. He was like, we're going to do this in camera. No, no, yeah, like, yeah. I get it. It's, I've, I've heard some John seal stories from uh, Walt Lloyd. Cause I think Walt was a camera operator for him on a few projects. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, he's, yeah, I mean, it it was, it it was great to see that pairing and, and it's interesting to see like what, uh, what do these filmmakers do who are used to working with, you know, conventional 35 millimeter, what do they do when they are given this uh, outrageous digital toolkit and what they did, you know, in my opinion is just a landmark. It's the kind of movie that we're going to be referencing for years. I, I should say too, as a, as a slight, uh, rabbit hole. There's a document, if you like Australian filmmaking, there's a documentary called Not Quite Hollywood that I can't recommend highly enough. Wow, okay. It's about the Australian exploitation scene in the, in the 60s and 70s. I'm so in. And it's, <laughs> you, you had me at Australian exploitation scene. It used to be on Netflix. I don't know if it's on Netflix anymore, wow. but you know, maybe we can find it and put it in the show notes. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like guys like Brian Trenchard Smith and um, uh, uh, Russell Mul- Mulcahy and like, you know, some of these guys uh, who came to the States and did, you know, amazing stuff. <laughs> Brian Drenchard Smith, of course, uh, directed, I think, two of the Leprechaun movies. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't think he I don't I don't think Mickens worked with him. Um, <laughs> but uh, but Brian, Tr- Brian Trenchard, the what there uh, there's a movie that they talk about that I saw that's in that documentary called the man from Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they literally like George Lazenby completely on fire in slow motion. And, it, and he, he wasn't expecting it to like, I think he knew that it was a stunt, but he didn't know that his whole jacket was going to get lit up the way that it does. And it's a moment of like genuine panic in George Lazenby's eyes. Oh my 
God. Um, <laughs> and supposedly like right after they finished George Lazenby beat the shit out of him. But, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, uh, but like there's, there's a lot of these guys who can't, and George Miller is like one, of, he's like one of the guys who really broke out of that scene and became kind of a super, uh, international superstar. Russell Mulcahy as well. Hmm. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, clearly if you look at George Miller's filmography, I mean, uh, yeah, that guy can do no wrong. That guy uh, you know, pretty much, yeah. I can't think of like one bad film. You know, I remember having to be talked into seeing babe pig in the city and then being like, oh, it's, it's awesome. No, it's awesome. That's a fantastic movie. So it's no, I know it, it's sort of the opposite of my, uh, my Harry Potter issue. I'm like, yeah. Oh, I'm watching a kid's <laughs> movie and it's making me feel like a little boy again. You know, ba- babe and babe pig in the city are both great. So you were the one who brought Bill Totolo to the table. Uh, what made you decide to uh, pitch him as a, uh, as a possible interview for us? Bill is very cerebral and I, I know he's like, he's kind of a, a scrappy brawler guy from Long Island. That's yeah. kind of like his, you know, but he's really cerebral. This guy, you know, puts a lot of thought into what he does. He's, um, you know, self-proclaimed cork sniffer when it comes to uh, gear and cinematography. And by cork sniffer, I like, you know, discerning this guy, you know, he's very, very discerning. And I'm, I'm the same way. I get it. I, uh, I just think he's really talented and I thought he'd be a great conversation. And because I just listened to the interview, he really was. Yeah, it was fascinating. And, uh, okay, well, so I think, I think that's enough. Let's just go to the interview. Here's Bill Totolo. The cinematography podcast interview. All right. So here we are. How do you do that with cameras? Uh, you pre-record and you just, I direct a lot too. So you yeah. just say, we're just getting focus and we're getting marks. Yeah. And the actors, you let them relax. You get them in the off moments. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Just gives you some extra shit. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, I do a lot of directing. Sometimes it's fun to interview somebody in character and they get out of their head and they're not thinking about the lines. Oh. Yeah. Soderbergh does it a lot. Yeah. And it's fun because you can have that voiceover while they're doing another activity and one informs the other in an interesting way. Sometimes they contradict each other and that's even more interesting. Cool. Yeah, I I didn't invent this, but I'm gonna steal that technique, dude. I steal everything. Um, (laughs) Full Frontal, Steven Soderbergh. It's a great film. I was I was not crazy about it, and I think it's because I I was seeing XL One ads for like six years, it seemed, and I was like, oh cool, Steven Soderbergh's like sticking it to film. And then I went and saw it. I'm like, this is like a commercial for film. (laughs) This is like a commercial for how much better film looks than anything else. Because that that those film segments did look gorgeous. Yeah, and then cut it against XL One footage that just looks mm, assy well i th- i had spoken to the lab he had worked with and he really made it look bad on purpose because he wanted that contrast between the two it wasn't trying to make yeah. the xl1 look good it was trying to make it look really bad i wonder did like canon immediately drop him out of all their ads because i mean there were so many ads right. that just featured soderbergh running around with the canon right. xl1 for a while and you know american cinematographer or it, whatever it's true it's interesting because i do admire him as a cinematographer too but when he did uh shea which was one of the early red yeah produced films it wasn't the greatest footage that first of the two parts because they um i know they didn't have a lot of lighting out there and they blew a lot of highlights and you know he everybody's learning how to process the red and you know obviously he's doing phenomenal work with the red now but oh early gosh. days did you see uh the nick yeah holy crap yeah I, i'm addicted to it i love that show it's so beautiful yeah and i heard an interview with him where he's like if you romanticize the past as soon as you see this <laughs> you'll not want to be back there and it's so true like you're just ugh, the muck and the mire oh yeah he said something on that uh, on an interview about that that I thought was pretty interesting too, where he was saying he was looking at the footage and there was something funky about everybody's eyes, and then he realized because he's shooting that on the Epic with the Red Dragon sensor that it was so light sensitive that he could see their pupils were had dilated more than he'd ever seen them yeah, before. Yeah, I think they're shooting. And I don't want to misquote. But I think they're shooting around twelve fifty ISO, maybe sixteen hundred. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're shooting pretty high and probably just all available light and. Well, that's never the case, but it's probably very low light levels, like you said. So, well, I think this is an interesting entry point, and uh, we'll go back and kind of get your 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 background and everything. Um, I may even rearrange this later. But to me, you direct and you DP. Now, do you do them both at the same time a lot, or do you only Yeah, do- I, I do work on that. I, I do a, uh, a weekly uh, directing workshop, and I try to work that muscle, because it, it is not natural. It's very hard to divide your mind like that. Yeah. It's kind of like, I do have a musical background, and I can't play guitar and I can't sing at the same time I can't do like you look at somebody like Giddy Lee who's working like Moog Taurus pedals playing bass and singing in French yeah and it, it to, to, to be fair he is a Canadian so it's not hard for him to sing in French <laughs> yeah well I mean I wanted to throw it out there <laughs> um, 
but yeah to to really be attuned to your actor to make sure that they're connecting moment to moment and to be on top of the cinematography and your framing especially if you are trying to do some technique where you're i don't know you you give yourself a set of laws you're trying to abide by like i'm i'm only gonna frame this person up according to a fibonacci spiral or some la-di-da bs i'm stealing that that's what i'm gonna do next (laughs) um yeah, you, you really do find yourself looking at framing a lot. Yeah. And so you've got to figure out how to check in with the actors and let them know you're paying attention to them and taking care of them while also serving the cinematography. It, it is, for me, it's very challenging, but it's really rewarding because it's like you're, you're uh, I'm going to sound like a, an art student, but like, you sound know. Sound it, do it, go with it. Yeah, I'm going to go for it. Um, yeah, you're composing that canvas. You're putting everything in that canvas and it's it's a bit of choreography. You're You're literally the third actor. You're the unseen participant in mm-hmm. that scene at that point uh, so what is your entry point like like talk about when you started directing and dping at the same time because to me this is just it's it's i and i've done it myself on really really small stuff with low consequences if i did a horrible job but like I, i've never done it on like a paid yeah gig. i'd say most of my stuff is is low uh but, you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah not a not a high budget thing a lot of my own stuff um you know, I've studied directing and I've studied cinematography because I just love both. I, I can make a living at cinematography. Um, I came from a financial background. I was in a different career and I felt really at home with the numbers and the math associated with camera department. You know, because you're talking about F-stops and inverse square law and mm. light being log and linear. And to me, that made a lot of sense. I could wrap my hands around that because art is so subjective, but you could kind of quantify cinematography. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's very, it's an art, but to get there, there's a lot of math. And so I felt very comfortable with that. So I figured, Is is finance also secretly an art? And I just, I just get stuck on the numbers. I'm going to say something really radical, but I think it is. Um, People have different ways of viewing accounting and people have different ways of viewing finance. If you're doing what's called forecasting, that's definitely a dark art. And those are the guys who make the most money. Like, where is this company going to be a quarter from now, two quarters from now? And they make all the money. Uh, and it's uncanny uh, how they come up with this stuff. I, I never made it to that level, but I mean, yeah. they're looking at what they call leading indicators. Uh, how's Chinese currency? Are we trading with them? How much U.S. steel are they buying? You know, you look at all this stuff to see where your position is going to be in your particular company. But math just always lives on the event horizon between, uh, you know, like what an average person might understand about something in Nirvana. Like, you know, like you have to pass through this level of math before you can ever even get there. Yeah. And I was never great at math. Um, I forced myself to learn it. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, you know, in high school I was the guy who was journaling and writing and reading, painting and playing guitar. And, um, yeah, I just forced myself to go to business school cause I felt that's what I'm weak in. And I want to, I wanted a, a regular job, quote unquote. Yeah. It, it ended up not being the right path for me, but, um, I just felt like, yeah, if you really apply yourself to it, you know, you can do it. If you're on this business path, yeah. how did you encounter film to be like, oh, that's a different thing I can do? Yeah, I know. It's funny. Um, you know, like I said, I, I was always kind of artistic growing up. People encouraged me to write. My teachers did. And like, you know, um, one of my teachers at the end of the year would always reward some students with books. And he gave me um, a Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. And I was into Mark Twain. Uh, so that was always my first passion. And I went to high school, which I thought it was a common experience, but everybody was a musician. I mean, there were jazz musicians, classical musicians, and some actually broke through and became very famous. But um, there was a long protracted period where people were just living in their parents' basement. And so I wanted to get a regular job and um, got the regular job, was unhappy, uh, and tried to apply my analytical skills to myself and saying, okay, I'm going to make a career change, but I, I'd like to do it only once. How long were you in the regular job before you were like, this is not my, this is not for me? I did it for totally eight years, but I think- Eight about, years, wow. Yeah, I know. I think about five years in, I felt like I was in a gilded cage. Ah, yes. You know, like you're going to have the tropes, you're going to have the rewards of a career, and you know, you, those become your friends, and those friends are buying houses, and they're getting yeah. married, and they're taking on mortgages, and they're having children. The golden handcuffs. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Because you can't get out. Yeah. You know, once you're married and you have the- you know, the, the house, your wife's not really going to just follow your dream. Um, so before that happened to me, yeah, I just, you know, this is like the early nineties and there's a show on called, it was like a promotional show called movie magic mm-hmm. and it aired in New York, probably like on WNEW or something like that. And it was just BTS footage behind the scenes. And they would show you like the latest Arnold Schwarzenegger film, whatever the big blockbuster was. Yeah. And it was just fascinating to me. And also at that time, I just kind of fell in love with movies because 
I really loved learning how other people behave in society because I was only exposed to like the bunch of knuckleheads I grew up with in Long Island. You know, I love them. I'm still best friends with them, but you know, I didn't see how other people behaved around the country. And I really loved learning that from film. And so I was really into film. I really loved that show. And so I took a long look at like, okay, here's what I'm good at. Here's what I'm bad at. And I just decided this is crazy, but I'm going to go to film school, you know, and I couldn't tell anybody that I was working with what I was studying. They just assumed I was taking advanced courses in business. So you're doing it at night or something? Yeah, I would work all day, uh, work till six o'clock. Then I'd go to MYU at night and they just had a school of continuing it. It wasn't Tish, but I get there around seven. Um, so like it, it would be the equivalent of like UCLA extension out here. Identical, identical. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, it would be instructors, you know, people who are working in the field and they would come and they would teach at night. Like there'd be uh, commercial directors, um, cinematographers would come. Uh, and so, so I did a couple of those programs. I, I attend class till 10, get on the train, get home around midnight, you know, get up at six in the morning, repeat, you know, super young. So you can do this. And, uh, yeah, when I turned 30, I, uh, quit my job and moved out here. So when I was 30, I, I was, I was, uh, an officer of the bank. And then a couple months later I was PA and, you know, interning. <laughs> What were you PAing on? Um, I was doing several things at once. I interned a little bit at Panavision um, for Kelly Simpson and the New Filmmakers Program. Uh, I was PAing at Propaganda, the commercial house. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember them. Yeah, I didn't get to work on anything super sexy because I, you know, I, I didn't work there that long. Um, but the projects did have big budgets. Um, did things like they brought a Japanese artist over named Seiko, and they tried to you know, find an American audience for her. She did a music video called Touch the Love and we shot at Huntington Gardens and a few commercials. And um, and at the same time, I was uh, camera assisting for free for all the student films at AFI. Oh, wow. Yeah, I get to meet a lot of cool people there. But wait, I mean, like, so how do you make the... Le- it, was it was it the Panavision connection? Or, like, it was uh, camera assisting something that you'd studied when you were uh, doing the NYU stuff? Or... Like, I mean, like camera assisting is such a specialized thing to just jump in. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't like high end stuff. It was mostly like loading and second day seeing Uh Airy SRs and SR2s. And yeah, you know, we got our hands on like Airy 16 millimeter equipment at NYU. And so I was comfortable with that. And and then, yeah, you know, out here I started going to UCLA Extension. Oh, cool. And Airy had some kind of camera assistant certification program where you got to load all their mags, learn how to build their cameras. Nice. Yeah. And it was like low stakes over at AFI, you know, because it's student films. Um, and even though they're spending a lot of money, yeah, you like didn't, low stakes unless you're the student. Well, I'm, you didn't have to whip out that mag in like less than a minute. You know, you. Could, oh yeah, yeah. You know, you you had five minutes to figure it out if you got stuck in in there or something in the changing tent or the changing bag. Uh, but I got to meet really cool people, um, like Mark um, David Armstrong, who did all the seven movies. Um, through UCLA connection, I ended up working with Eric Stilberg a lot and Jason Reitman. Oh, wow. And early days when they're still doing student films. And um, yeah, so that kind of does form your foundation a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it does my early my early experiences. And did you stick in the camera department? Like, did you, did, so did you rise up to, to DPing through entirely through camera? No, um, I was really tired of working for nothing and working crazy hours. I mean, I was doing Children of the Corn Part 6 like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. So you're on the set of Children of the Corn Part 6. You're like, I was an officer at a bank. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I could, was... I could be a sleeper right I now. was just the loader on that film. Yeah. And um, we were doing, completely doing that film on short ends. And so, uh, like, yeah, like 200 feet, 300 feet. People who came up in the digital age will never appreciate what a tremendous pain in the ass short ends were in yeah. their day. And they were... It was a, a great way to save some money, but good lord, it, it, it wasted a lot of time too. Yeah, and here's the sad story: I was getting I was getting screwed because they accused me of stealing. Because what happened is the company that was providing the short ends were giving us three inch cores instead of two inch cores, so they're shorting them fifty feet of roll. Oh, that's dickish. It is, and then they accused me. Can you say which company? They're all out of. Business I don't even now remember anyway. the name. I don't even remember the name. Doctor Rostock, short ends, any of those guys. Yeah, I, I none of them are around anymore. Yeah, I don't know who it was. To tell you the truth, it was, it's like we're talking seventeen years ago. Yeah, uh. and um, like I think it was like a three and a half week production, and I was making a hundred dollars a day. So I was like, great, I'll have some Christmas money, you know, because we were <laughs> shooting around Thanksgiving. But two weeks into production, they're like, we are short like 5,000 feet of film or some crazy number. And, you know, you're responsible for the film. And they brought down their accountants from in-house and they're literally accusing me of stealing. And it was a really ugly experience. I was getting really tired of 
working 15 hours a day, making $100 a day, and then being accused of stealing. So I had sent out 300 resumes prior to that, and um, one of them hit, and it was E! Entertainment Television. And they were staffing up a new position called Motion Control. Mm -hmm. And it's not motion control like we think about, like in commercials, like the big rigs. This was like a copy stand that this Russian robotics engineer put together. It was for like moving in on photographs and stuff, right? Exactly. And it was kind of cool because you could do a five by seven, you could do an eight by 10, you could do a map or you could do a slide. And he'd Mm -hmm. done a really good job with it. And I was the only one in the building who did it. And so they hired me. I got a staff position. I got a salary that was decent and I got benefits. And I thought I'd figured out Hollywood. <laughs> all, all my friends are like broke. They're toiling away, trying to go from loaded to second, second to first. And here I am. I have my own my own bay. Yeah. The only guy who's doing it and getting really treated pretty well. And back at that period, I would say that E was actually a fun place to work. Yeah, I know some people who worked there at the time and it, it, they called it E University and they kind totally. of just had their own way of doing it. Yeah, it was you know, it was not a great way to work, but it was kind of like 50s cable. Like we just made it work. It was a lot yeah. of fun. And I ingratiated myself with the ENG department. So I was always shooting junkets and red carpets and interviews on the weekend. Oh, cool. So here I am not long ago, not not, not long prior to that, I was, you know, on Long Island and, and camera assisting and Hollywood was a million miles away. And all of a sudden I find myself shooting interviews with Robin Williams and George Lucas and Tom Hanks. Wow. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot from those guys because they um, they are really, I, I feel like that field doesn't get enough credit, but those guys have become masters at lighting women to look really good on screen. Like the people who do ENG kind of stuff? Yeah, like if you're doing a sit-down interview or a junket with, say, a woman who made her fame in her early 20s but is now maybe 40 and they're doing a retrospective on her career, you know, that's a person who's very self-conscious of her looks. I mean... She's probably still drop dead gorgeous. Yeah. But we know that ageism exists in Hollywood and people are very concerned about their appearance. I I mean, and these guys just knew beauty lighting in and out and they really took their career seriously and they really wanted to protect, protect those stars because that's the bread and butter of a company like that. It's interesting because I think, I think that not enough gets said about doing like really, really good interview lighting. I was doing a project years ago where we needed to make, we needed to shoot a bunch of interviews and we needed to make them look good. And it was for, it was for, uh, Sony, um, and it was kind of a big client and it was kind of a big deal. And they wanted it to look like 2020 or 60 minutes. They wanted it. They wanted that kind of look. And I talked to a bunch of DPs I knew and, and I was like, do you have a real, like, have you done that? And they were like, they were all like, yeah, I've done tons of that. I'm like, you have a reel of it. And, uh, they were like, well, you know, I take out the trash too. It's not on my reel. Like they, it was like, yeah, who can't do that? But then we found this guy, uh, I should probably get him on here someday named Will Hook who like specializes in high-end interview stuff and his stuff looks i mean it just pops like you you can't believe how great it looks when you see it and uh and i mean i I feel like there's there's such an art to that and you know a lot of times when i'm working with the dp like i can tell what they're doing and why they're doing it but like the level of craft and art that will was putting into just what to me seemed like it's a shot of a guy's face you just need needs to look like him you know but no what he did was so above and beyond that and so much better looking and you know i still look at that piece and i'm I'm blown away at the work he does and he does he has a production company and that's pretty much all he does or like high-end behind the scenes and stuff yeah there's a lot of guys who think you can just throw up a light panel and have illumination and yeah you can you totally can but if you want to sculpt that face and you want to make it look a little leaner do you want to start filling in some of the crow's feet and you want to really give some separation and, and make the hair look good and yeah you know there's people who are very very aware of lighting i mean I've never lit Barbara Streisand, but we know that she brings in her own lighting team. Um, I've As had, well, she should. Yeah, no, I mean, but she looks beautiful, but yeah, yeah. she knows her angles and she knows where the light should go. I, um, yeah, I, I, not that long ago, I was shooting a docu series for AOL and PBS called Makers. And it's about all these influential women in America, and it's actually a really uplifting type of series. I was very proud to work on it. Cool. And um, I didn't do Michelle Obama, but they were getting the ilks of Michelle Obama and Oprah. But I was shooting an A-list woman who is now 40s and um, had come out of some addictions, we'll say. And she was very aware of her lighting. And um, I had given her what I thought was really good lighting, but she politely asked me to just make a few minor adjustments. And it became very evident to me that she knew exactly what she was doing. And I was more than happy to appease her. And I actually learned something in the process. Oh, cool. Yeah. 
Like she wasn't blowing smoke. She knew what she was doing. She knew it. She knew what she needed is the best way to put it. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Like what kind of thing did she have you do or, you know, it's very basic, but, um, you know, I wanted to light with an off camera key and I was giving her a super soft light. And I also gave her the classic clamshell, which is a light underneath as well. Mm -hmm. And gives a really great pop to the eyes while filling in shadows under the chin. But she knew she needed that key light right over the lens, which is a classic way to light as well. And, um, yeah, I know. What's to, what's the purpose of that? What does it do specifically? Well, the light, the photons literally coming from the lens are reflected back into the lens, and you're filling up any nook and cranny that the lens would see. Mm-hmm. So, you might look a little to the left, a little to the right, but if if that lens is is you know if you put that light right from where the lens is, um, all those wrinkles, all those lines get filled up. Oh, and, nice. Um, it it does really does remove some age and flattens out the image, and then you can still sculpt with a side light or something. But you definitely want that frontal source. I mean, that's how they shoot like high-end cosmetic ads and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it definitely worked for her. Mo- she who shall remain her name. <laughs> I'll ask you when <laughs> we're done. I can tell you that you're totally no, I, I, I'm like, my brain's going a mile a minute. But, it could be a million people. Uh, yeah. Could be lots of people. Be a mystery for the ages. So how long are you at eat? Uh, I did. I stayed a little too long. Um, it went through several regime, regime changes and kind of lost its magic. Um, I was there nine years. I did motion control for six, but I also did E News Live, so I got to learn how to work in a live studio and work on PEDS and boom and truck and pull my own focus all at the same time while live. Yeah, and yeah I mean, it's funny. Those guys think nothing of it. Like, if they if they heard this, they'd be like, I don't know why Bill's talking about it. It's not a big deal. <laughs> but, like, I was like, you know, this is, this is nuts. Like, I'm used to having a camera assistant and I'm used, or being a focus puller or having somebody push a dolly. You're literally doing it all. Yeah, in yeah. Those guys do it all on, on their own. So I learned how to do that, but I was always paying attention to the lighting design. As I made friends with the lighting designer and learned how to light studios, you know, so you always have a key light wherever you look. If you turn and turn to your host, you have a key light. If you turn to camera, you still have a key light. So it was an interesting discipline. So you have to set multiple key lights within the yeah. same studio. Yeah. And then you have a dimming board. You could dim them if you need to. Usually in that situation, you're not because you don't want to see the light levels change. But Studio lighting is a complete mystery to me. I've never, I mean, like, you know, news, news kind of stuff or, you know, that, that whole ilk is completely mysterious. And even though like I've done a lot of theater, I still, I still don't quite get what the theory is because it, because it's so different than location film lighting or even soundstage film lighting you're trying to make look like a location yeah it's you're not going for a naturalistic look but you're making people look as good as possible you're making them pop you don't want the background to be harder than they are but you do want the set to look good as well because you spent a lot of money on that set Um, and you're fixing lights so you have fixed positions for talent and fixed positions for lights and the lights on the grid and they're probably more like Leco kind of lights and stage lighting than they are like what you would have on a on a film set There, there are a lot of hard marks yeah, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, people light so many different ways. There, there's, there are Lecos, but then there's guys who light with larger sources. Hell, I mean, I learned something called a nester, which is basically a box made out of foam core with a slit in the middle that, that you can drop diffusion panel in. So you have kind of like a two foot by two foot by two foot box in front of your, like say your tungsten 1K or, or like a studio 1K or a studio 2K. So you box it in and then you drop, you make a slit in the middle of that box and you just drop that diffusion down. You're mm-hmm. kind of like making your own chimera, but you're controlling that light. So it's just a, your key. You understand? So yeah. like you're controlling the spill. So there's so many different ways to do it. The, the Leco is nice because you have the blades, but it's a small hard source. Yeah, yeah. But then I've seen people make nesters that are like 10 feet wide. Oh, really? Yeah. For a bank of lights. So there's so many different ways to do it. And then later in life when I ended up doing studios, I, I was very confident because I was, I was picking people's brains, watching how they did it. So before we go a whole lot further, I have my suspicions, but I have my, my stock question <laughs> that, I, this up. that I keep asking, um, which which is, do you believe that when you're working on, uh, when you're when you're setting up a camera, or when you're when you're lighting a scene, are you choosing a composition? Are you mostly composition focused, or are you lighting and then finding a composition within within the lighting scheme that you've built? Yeah, it's so funny. I've I've heard you ask that question. I find myself thinking about it a lot, and. Um, I've read in interviews where Roger Deakins is like, he's all about composition. He's telling yeah. the story in the composition. And I talked to Vilmos Zygmunt at a class I took, and he's all about, I can't give up the lighting. I mean, here, here's two heavyweights, right? Yeah. Saying con- conflicting. So where do I fall in there? It's like, it's kind of like that anamorphic versus spherical question. <laughs> it's like they both contribute so much 
but I kind of feel like if I'm behind the camera and I'm moving with the actors, I feel like mom and dad at home aren't as attuned to the lighting as they are the composition. Yeah. And I just love how the Coen brothers do compositions with Deacons, how they can turn like a dolly shot, like they'll just take a two shot and then keep going and it turns into a over the shoulder and then it turns into a single. And I think there's a beauty in, in blocking that doesn't get talked about and that's part of composition. So I think maybe I'm on the slightly on the composition side. Interesting. Well, and I'll, I think it might make sense too, given that you also direct a lot, that you know, because like direct directing is a lot less about the lighting, you know, as, yeah. than it is about saying what you want it to look or feel like. Uh, than it is like directors can dictate composition. In fact, one of the people on the podcast literally said that's a stupid question because the composition is the director's job. But I feel like that depends on like if you hire Roger Deakins to shoot your thing and he says, you know, I want a two shot and the director says, I want an over the shoulder. Eventually, if you're smart, you're probably going to go with what Deakins <laughs> says, you know, he knows what he's talking yeah. about. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. I'm prepping my first micro budget feature right now. And the director is really fantastic with actors and fantastic with story. Can you define micro budget with, like, Oh geez, it's under a hundred grand. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, some people micro budget is you know five grand. I know no, and some people micro budget is like half a million. I know. Well, I've, sometimes you'll hear studio people say like, "Oh, it's micro budget. It's two million. And I'm like, it, "That's not micro budget. If you can go union, you're not micro budget. I know. I know. Um, so he doesn't have a strong compositional background. So I'm asking him to really try to hone that, and I'm trying to show him films. And he's kind of resisting a little bit mm -hmm. because he wants to 100 percent to find that story first, and I understand that. But I'm like, just rip out fashion ads. Start. Let's start building a vocabulary. Pinterest, man. Pinterest is a great way to do this. That's probably a really good just idea. Set up a Pinterest board. Just go around the internet yeah. and pin shit that you, that you like the way it looks. Yeah. No, that's a really good idea. And yeah, so I'm always forwarding them interesting things and taking shots and sending it to them. And and because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to do television coverage on a feature film. You don't want to do master over over master over over. It's so boring. Oh, it's super boring. And you don't want to do formulaic. Like I've heard people say. You've probably read, uh, oh, who's the guy who wrote The Cat in the Wind? Um, Don't Kill the Cat. Oh, wait, uh, Save the Cat. Oh, Blake Snyder. Actually, it's not Blake Snyder. It's, I remember Dove Sivin, Simmons. You remember him, Dove S.S. Simmons? Dove S.S. Simmons, yeah. You know, I read that book from real to deal, and his his thing is, you know, how to make stuff really fast and efficient on a micro budget. And, and you know, he does have some good ideas, but I try to make my own formulas, I guess. Mm -hmm. And his the whole thing was like, shoot your coverage, do your master, you're over, and do a cat in the window shot which is like just an odd angle, like your artistic angle, and then yeah. you're out. And so I'm trying to develop this gentleman I'm working with um, to get kind of past anything. For, like I just don't want a, a feature to look like TV coverage. Yeah. Now TV now is pretty amazing. So when I say TV coverage, I'm just thinking like sitcoms that yeah. I grew up with. Or you know? A-Team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's amazing. You could tell there are some feature film directors who came from TV, who are utterly amazing, like Sidney Lumet, right? Yeah. But then there's other guys who are still talented, but their coverage is TV coverage. It's just that master over every single shot. Yeah, yeah. You watch it with the sound off, which which is good training ground for any cameraman. And you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize it, but every single, this, single shot in this film, every single shot in this film is master over, over. Coverage is, is such a, I mean, I think it's it's worth talking about too, because there are different directors who do it differently. And obviously DPs as well. I always think about Guillermo del Toro's films and how he really generally doesn't do coverage. He'll have like a master shot that brings you into a scene and then another master, like a sub master that connects to it and takes you out of the scene. Yeah, that's the art of the wonder. Yeah. You know, just, and blocking that wonder is a lot of fun. So uh, Spielberg, Spielberg does masterful wonders like, yeah. with, with techno cranes and, and then the blocking. People come in naturally and they're coming in and out. But then you go to like uh, Peter Berg or Paul Greengrass who, you know, get like, it, it seems like they just have an infinite number of camera operators getting yeah. in, you know, like there's always like a very documentary like shot mm -hmm. of everything, but it's very, very cutty. Um, you know, it's, it's a definite style. Obviously it's made in the edit bay, whereas Guillermo del Toro's movies are made before he shoots them, mm -hmm. you know, or Alfonso Cuaron or, you know, like a lot of, a lot of filmmakers who kind of stick to uh, minimal coverage. What are your thoughts? Like, how do you prefer when you're directing? How do you prefer to do it? And when you're DPing, do you try and bend the director to one way or the other? Well, I think what's the right way? What's the right way to shoot this? And then I think what's the wrong way? And I like to explore the wrong way because it just opens me up. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I, I like to play the opposites. Um, so instead of getting that establishing shot and moving into the over, I try never to do master over over. I'm like, how else can I do it? Um, occasionally it's fine to do master over over. Um, well, sometimes you just don't even have a choice. 
Yeah, and sometimes that's what the audience expects. Yeah. Maybe in an, an intense dialogue scene. Like, I mean, if Michael Mann could do it in Heat between Pacino and De Niro, yeah. then it's valid, right? And I think Dante Spinotti shot that, and he's one of my favorite DP. So yeah, it's absolutely the, valid. Like the opening scene in The Social Network, you know, with Fincher, which is, you know, very coveragey, but like, how else do you do two people sitting at a table talking to each other? That's that's the trick. Like, can you bring, can you walk him in? Can you stay with, um, oh, what's the actor's name who played that? Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah. Can you stay with Jesse on the walk-in, right? And then have them sit 90 degrees apart instead of 180 degrees apart. I don't know. Maybe that's more intimate. Yeah. Or, yeah. Can you tell, what's the wrong way to do that? Um, I'm, I'm not second-guessing Fincher. I love his work. You yeah, know? yeah. You know, it's a, a, a TV show that's being blocked masterfully now. It's House of Cards. Oh, yeah. And, like, I just look at that. I'm in awe. How do they get that coverage in that period of time? I don't know. It's They have a huge budget. <laughs> they do, uh, yeah, they do. But it's also, there's so much art into it. Uh, and, and the behind the scenes footage on that is really great too. That's really creative how they're getting their blocking. And I love how they're like doing almost no handheld in that. They're like going against like the modern style. So how are they, how are they getting, I mean, like how so, would you describe it? Some of the stuff I've seen, like they're on uh, dolly tracks and um, the dolly has got a slider on it. Yeah. So they'll literally start off low at a low angle, looking up dolly into somebody walking towards camera as they're coming up. Say Kevin Spacey's walking towards camera. He's a little to the left. They'll, they'll, boom up on the dolly as they're trucking forward and then at the last minute they'll slide the the slider to the left and come into their close up and then they'll go backwards and we kind of like repeat it and backwards and like just follow the character backwards Mm -hmm. and it kind of almost feels like it's on a gimbal like a gimbal can start off low and then come up high and then slide to the left but it's just so static and so locked in that it feels like you're on very solid ground and I guess it plays into the subtext of that of that TV show and I, I oh, really love sure. that blocking it's a great show I wish I could I'm trying to push for something similar to that on on the micro budget feature yeah plus, plus I also like the blocking on on True Detective oh god they're doing something really interesting with like um, low swooping jibs like their camera's really low and kind of swooping and then they'll cut to another one that's kind of coming in at the opposite angle it's, you know and I uh, love their car shots too that show is so beautiful and I, and it, I feel like, I mean, you know, like you'll look at, you know, people talk about the 1970s for features. I feel like they're going to talk about right now for television. I feel like people like television's never been better than it is right now. Yeah. It's funny. Like the first half of my year was loaded up. I was really busy. And now I've completed two shows back to back and now I'm kind of slow, which is great because now I can like attend to like life, pay my taxes and take care of my house. But I'm catching yeah, fuck up. that. Yeah. <laughs> But now, like, my DVR is loaded, and this is the first time I'm really catching up on television, and I'm really enjoying it, you know? Like I said, House of Cards, fantastic. True Detective, fantastic. Even the Nick. The Nick, uh, Downton Abbey. Yeah. You know, lots of good stuff. I haven't done Breaking Bad yet, but I'm looking <gasps> forward to Oh, man. I, know, I, I just want to binge all that. Like, Buckle up. <laughs> it's going to be a bumpy night. So uh, let's keep talking about, um, you know, like, where your career went. So you were at E for eight years? Uh, yeah, about eight and a half. The last two were, um, I ended up shooting robotic cameras for the morning show for Ryan Seacrest. Uh-huh. And I had to get up at 4 a.m. And I wasn't really doing anything. It was I was just babysitting cameras. And so I knew I had to I knew I knew had to go. I just didn't have the guts to go freelance again. So when you started there, what kind of shows? Was it like Mysteries and Scandals? Yeah, and it, was Mystery, Hollywood it was Stars? Uh, E! True Hollywood Stories, Mysteries and Scandals. They still had Wild on. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, it was actually kind of fun. But then it kind of devolved into... Uh, you know, they had all the reality then uh, when I left. They had the Kardashians. It was post Anna Nicole. That Anna Nicole. Was I remember yeah. that Anna Nicole show. That was about the time I stopped watching E. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people had that feeling. A lot of people really fell in love with her as a person on staff. But the show was just so exploitative. Exploitative. Yeah. You know, what she was going through. That I think it put a bad taste in people's mouth. And that's part of that regime change. You know, just go for the bottom line, I think. Yeah. I might be speaking a little bit beyond my experience because I'm not... A producer I'm not in charge of ratings but I personally I felt like I we lost that fun kind of collegiate vibe around there and so I was ready to go and I stayed too long and um, so I left and I formed my own little company and started taking on my own clients and mm-hmm. um, I went to what we call graduate school I went to TV Guide Network <laughs> uh, and, and just strictly I wasn't a, an employee of theirs they were just a client of mine and so they were good for a lot of a lot of money because I did a lot of specials for them, a lot of behind the scenes stuff for them. Uh-huh. Um, but that was identical to what I was doing at E, but where I actually got to grow a little bit was over at AOL um, because I did start working um, on all the live studio performances there. What what year about is this? Uh, about 2008. 
And they had a really creative DP there who'd been there for a long time. And I actually, it was the first time I actually got to work under somebody for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. It definitely wasn't a mentorship relationship, but I just got to observe somebody who was talented working. And he would light different acts and how he would block it and, and treat the cameras and treat the crew. And that was really enlightening. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then time came, he moved on. And well, what kind of what kind of stuff were they shooting on? What kind of gear were they using? What were we shooting? There, once they went HD, they got on the Vericam twenty seven hundred. Prior to that, I think it was the S. What was it called? The SDX nine hundred before the HDX. SDX nine hundred. Yeah, I'm very well. <laughs> yeah, it was that's, a good. That's cam- a, that's an amazing camera. That's yeah. like the best SD camera that ever got made. Yeah, exactly. And so we were shooting on that, and um, tons of lights. You know, they have a pretty good sized studio over there, and they all have brand new equipment. Um, Where are they? In Beverly Hills. Okay. Yeah. Right off Maple. And right off Maple and Third. Um, and so everything is in like premium condition over there because it doesn't go out. It doesn't go out into the field. And uh, they have really. How really, are they financing? How is AOL financing this stuff? Uh, I, don't, I don't understand. Dude, they sold all their patents to Microsoft. They got a billion dollars. Oh, so they can just yeah. keep. Because <laughs> I'm yeah. like, is, are there that many people who haven't canceled their dial up uh, connection? There are a lot of people that haven't canceled dial up, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah they, that is a source of income for them. Um, but they actually, they grow through attrition. They, they acquire companies. So they've got a whole bunch of companies that we visit and take for granted that are owned by AOL. They've got a great show on called TransLogic. And it's a, it's a transportation based website Yeah, with its own programming. Well, and Huffington Post, they own Huffington Post, right? Yeah. They bought that a few years ago. They acquired that for 350 mil too. I actually, I shot the live launch of that. Nice. And, um, yeah, it was, it was okay. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, it was just you're, as a cameraman, the content was kind of cool, but as a cameraman, you're just kind of stuck like in a, in a very still location. Like your camera doesn't move. There's really not any blocking. There was no trucking, no focus pulling. Just You're just kind of babysitting your camera. So that was not exciting as a camera operator. Yeah. So I only stayed about a week. You know, they asked me to come. At AOL. Out. Or for HPL for HuffPost. Oh, got it. I did years at, at AOL. In fact, I still occasionally go over there. Mm-hmm. You know, there's right now there's not a lot of programming in California for them. They have a New York based office too, uh, but occasionally, um, what did I do for them? Uh, they have a thing with, called Delta Tech Download. I did a couple of those. It's in-flight entertainment for Delta. Oh, okay. A- AOL ends up shooting somehow. I've done a couple of those. How long were you a TV guide? TV guy, I still do a special for them once in a while. And here's an interesting story. The, the most interesting uh, special I did for them, they, they, um, they're one of the two outlets that are allowed to do coverage for Survivor. Um, Survivor is a CBS show, and they have an interest in TV Guide Network. So CBS hires its in-house crew, and they also hire a TV Guide to shoot Survivor, and that's a lot of fun. So, so yeah, is there, um, probably started 2008, still do a little bit of work with them. But they're they're almost closed. They do n- almost no original content right now. So I was just doing the story. They have a special called The Story Behind. Mm-hmm. And it rates pretty well for them. It's like the story behind Friends, the story behind ER. Mm-hmm. So you go into Warren Littlefield's home and you interview Warren Littlefield and you get to hang out with Warren, Warren Littlefield. That's crazy. And it was at the time he was producing Fargo. So you're kidding. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're kind of like, hey, what are you doing with Fargo? You know? And that ended up being a great show, by the way. I haven't seen that one yet. Dude, it, yeah, that was a good one. I hear it's very good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I learned a lot at AOL Studios because when the DP left, they allowed me to slide into that position. And so I really honed my knowledge of rock and roll style studio lighting. So now I'm working with like Krypton movers and color blasts and brick blasters and all that kind of stuff they use for rock and roll and smoke and lasers. Mm-hmm. And um, I got to do the conversion from SD to HD and our first act was Slayer. That's cool. It was cool. And um, it was amazing because we really uh, allowed ourselves to just change the style completely. It was a very locked in style for about eight years. But then when they changed over, they wanted to make a difference. And I, Dude, I got to tell you, what a better band to start off with than Slayer. I mean, I was not a, a person who listened to that music up till that point. Uh, but it, it the, the creativity was just unleashed. There's like, there was no boundaries. Um I actually ran into Kerry came from Slayer at the NAMM show and I approached him, which was like a dumb, I was just kind of being a fanboy, like, hey, you know, I'm yeah, shooting yeah. your live studio performance at well. And I don't know if he cared. And I said, do you have any thoughts on your lighting? And he made it clear he just didn't want any feminine colors. 
uh-huh. we'll say. And I think he was just, you know, he wants to protect his brand and he wanted to make sure that he was taken care of. So I took that to heart. And so I watched hours and hours of footage, of live footage of Slayer and listened to their music and tried to listen to what's behind their music. And um, so what, what's behind what's behind their music? You know, some of the songs are social critiques, you know, and um, behind like a lot of speed metal. Um, so there's something to it. I could see why people hook into that style of music. And so yeah. I, I didn't want to fall into any tropes or cliches. I didn't want to, you know, I kind of wanted to get into, is there a subtext to this music? Is there a way to like the subtext for Slayer, you know, and honor what Carrie King said, you know? So I really try to also felt like there's no creative boundaries with a band like, with a band like that. So I worked with, um, our, our board operators and I worked with our electricians and our studio designers. And we, we came up with a lot of cool stuff for that. We had, uh, something called, uh, shark tooth. I think it's called shark tooth curtain, which is like this plastic curtain that looks like, like it's a mesh curtain that, that is got a lot, like a lot of plastic that looks like metal almost. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun to light. And so we put, um, color blasts on either side of that. And we brought in lots of rock and roll trust for that and lots of smoke and lasers and, I did the monofilament behind the lens gag to make it look like anamorphic lens flares and I'd fire lights right down our barrel. So what's the monofilament behind the lens gag? That's a new gag for me. I've never heard that. This one. is a cool one. It's an old camera trick. Um, a friend of mine taught it to me. Um, if you put very thin fishing line vertically behind a lens, you will get a horizontal lens streak. If you fire a hot lens right down the barrel, a hot light right down the barrel. Really? Yeah. Which, which some people think looks cool and other people don't, but I, I really liked it a lot and I ended up using it quite a bit. But you got to kind of use it wide open and you have to have special gag lights to fire right down the barrel of your lens. Of course. And when you're shooting Slayer, it looks really freaking cool. Um, the one thing we discovered by accident is I kind of put these, these LED color blasts on either side of this shark curtain. And um, I was talking to my board up. I'm like, let's cycle through. Let's find some colors. Let's find some looks. Let's find something that's cool here. A lot of times you just you don't really know what you're looking for. You just want to find it. And we had we were doing a pre light, so we had time. I'm, I'm sorry, real quick. What kind of cameras were you using? At this point, this is the first shoot we're using the uh, Vericam 2700 slide. Okay, so that's like an ENG style lens, like an HD, but still uh, uh, HD Fujinon, yeah, 14 by. And it's a two third inch CCD yeah. or whatever. So. It's a CCD, yes. So you're not getting a lot of the artifacting from a CMOS sensor. But you're still getting that monofilament. So how do you do the monofilament? I'm sorry, I don't mean to, to oh. fetishize this, but how do you do the mono? I always wonder on on uh, you know cameras where the camera has to talk electronically to the lens. How do you put stuff behind the lens? You know, like when I was in film school, I used to love putting pantyhose behind the lens and all you know, tricks like that. But how do you do that without it? Sl- like, how do you control where it goes? It's really similar idea. Um, you, you pull the lens off and you put a little snot tape on the north and south side of the barrel, of the rear barrel, on the rear side of the lens. And you make sure that that, that filament is perfectly straight because if it's a little off, your um, your flare is crooked. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just snot tape. And um, you don't put it on the outer perimeter of the barrel. You kind of put it on the flat side. So you're kind of perpendicular to the entry point, if that makes any sense, going into the turret of the of of the of the camera. Okay. So that filament isn't sticking out. You're not getting caught up in, in the mount or anything. So it's totally just on the inside of the lens. Yeah. yeah. I would be so afraid of it just getting like unstuck and just floating around in the camera or something. It did never, it didn't touch any elements. So there was nothing that knocked it around. Have you used that trick on, you know, like more modern cameras like Alexa's or Red's or anything like that? I use it on my F3. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. And I've used it on DSLRs. Really? Yeah. I'm always trying to figure out how to do that with DSLRs. I'll have to talk to you more about that. Sure. The trick is don't do it on a wide-angle lens and don't do it with a deep f-stop. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could go a little wider, but you want to make sure you're like at a 2.8 because you, otherwise it'll be in focus. Yeah. Um, so If you rotated it sideways, what would you get a, would you get a different effect? Yeah. But, but it yeah. would still be kind of cool? I didn't like it because then it didn't look like an anamorphic flare. It looks like, like some weird gag. Yeah. It, it has to be horizontal for my eye. Got it. Perfectly horizontal. And that's the, that's the thing. You have to really fire like an LED down it and make sure you're getting it right. I'm going to go buy some monofilament on the way home. Interesting. The happy accident that happened when my board up uh, was cycling through looks is those LEDs can flicker so fast. You've probably experienced that. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's shocking. And we hit two similar wavelengths. It was like, Purple and blue are very close on the color spectrum. 
So I think that that wavelength is hitting your eye, not exactly at the same time, but very close. So the effect it had with like purple behind, the color purple behind the shark tooth uh, curtain and blue in front of it, cycling at that wavelength really fast flickering, is it made it look like the curtains were, were kind of like, like moving like a wave. Mm-hmm. It looked three-dimensional and it made you nauseous. Like it started undulating. Mm-hmm. It looked like something you would see in Disney. And it was amazing. And I'm like, lock that in. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know when we're going to use that, but this is Slayer. That's going to be one of our looks. And right about that time, the band walked in and they wanted to see what we had. You know, So we were, we were like three quarters done with lighting. So we're cycling through some of the looks. You know, Of course, I'm using blood red for rain and blood. I'm using the opposite. I'm using cyan to backlight them, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Got lots of... Uh, I got Krypton movers with uh, gobos in them. I got smoke, so I got shafts of light, you know. And I'm showing them, say, hey, please look through the uh, the monitors because then you'll see the anamorphic flares. And then I'm like, you know what? Let's, let's show them, see what they think of this flicker effect we have with making the curtains look like they're moving. We showed them that, and they, they were in awe. They loved it. They're like, oh, you know, and that's when I knew, I knew we were going to be okay. Like, we, we kind of won them over. That's cool. Yeah, it was cool. To make a band like Slayer happy meant a lot to me. And I think they feed off that a little bit, you know? I mean, these are pros. They've been doing it for years, so they've seen everything. But I feel like if we just did flat Chimera box lighting, which we were accustomed to doing, I just don't think they would have been really enthusiastic about it. You know? So you've you've done a lot of, like, you know, in-studio in kind of stuff or, like, li- live show lighting, which is which is a different kind of a thing, uh, or, you know, newsy kind of stuff. And then you've also done a lot of, like, more cinematic kind of stuff. Uh, how does one inform the other? How, did, how like what what lessons can you take from one and apply it to the other? Yeah, I'd have to. Th- um, how does one inform the other? Or do they not inform each other at all? No, I guess I think that'd be arrogant of me to say they don't inform each other. I mean, you're still. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way: when I'm lighting a woman, I'm still thinking about what I learned to eat. Mm-hmm. When, when I when I'm aware that I have to satisfy a narrative thread and I have to satisfy the subtext, but I also have to protect the artist who's concerned about her image. So I feel comfortable that I know how to light a woman and or men who's had a bad night. <laughs> I mean, look at me. I, I, you know, I do a lot of modeling on myself. I know I'm not a great looking guy, so I have a lot of flaws. So if I can make myself look decent on camera, I know I can make anybody look decent on camera. <laughs> that's not me being self-deprecating. Maybe it's a blessing. Maybe it's a curse. But, you know, if you have a weak chin, I know how to light that. You know, if you have some crow's feet or some wrinkles, I can light that. If you have a full face, I know how to light that. So doing like the news gathering style lighting or, or the news studio style lighting is... I, if I'm hearing you correctly, it, it's like a crash course in how to make people look as good as you possibly can. I think and then so. you can back that shit off when you're w- I, to I, whatever degree you want. Absolutely, a lot of the rules apply. You're still going to go to the clamshell, right? The you know the the light above your lens, and you're going to slide in like maybe a beadboard below the lens, and you're going to do what's called the classic clamshell and get a beautiful eye light. Um, you know, you would see that a lot on Sex in the City when they wanted to make Sarah Jessica Parker look just absolutely yeah. gorgeous. They would kind of go to that kind of style of lighting. Um, yeah, there's definitely classic uh, lighting gags that you can go to that you see all the time. Um, but a lot of times I'm thinking against that because it can be, it can hurt me. Sometimes I feel like my default is to light flat and that's not the style that I want to do all the time. It's, it's rarely the style I want to do now. A lot of times I want to do side lighting, three-quarter lighting from the yeah. back. You know. When you started doing more cinematic kind of stuff, did you find it freeing or did you find it terrifying that you that you didn't have, that, that there suddenly wasn't this very specific objective standard to go for? No, I love it because now um, a lot of times if I inherit a show, say from Discovery, there is a three-inch thick style manual that I have to adhere to oh. because it's been established in season one or by another DP. But if I'm doing a narrative piece, whether you know, a short piece or something, then I feel like we can discover it on our own, and that's much more exciting. Yeah. You know, and you know, the director and I could say, we can define the rules any way we want. You know, somebody gets a warm fill light, somebody gets a hot backlight, somebody gets a beauty light. Somebody, sometimes we'll just put a one by one panel, and we'll just Cardellini clamp that right on top of the camera, and this girl will follow her through a crowd, but she always has her beauty light. So, I, and I guess this is almost becoming one of my stock questions, but it's something I'm very, I'm very interested in. So, like you're handed a new script that you're going to be shooting and you know, for the moment, let's just uh, focus on cinematography. Uh, 
do you have a process or how do you go about kind of finding these looks or, or whatever technique or, you know, the, the visual arc or whatever, what, what do you look at or how do you discover how you're going to tell the story visually? Well, I think because I didn't come up through a camera department and because I did study writing and directing, I kind of come at it through that story point of view. Like I, I admire those guys who know exactly what they need from their key grip and their gaffer, but I'm going to go through like a very academic process like the first one i hate to say it i hate to say it because people are going to judge me but uh, i'm going to do a dialectical <laughs> statement you know i'm gonna i'm gonna break it down to um make a make a statement counter statement a resolution about this character mm-hmm. and then i'm gonna i'm gonna go robert mckee on you i'm gonna say what's the said about this character and what's the unsaid and what's the unsayable and that's going to lead me to the truth of this character and that way i feel like i'm going to avoid my knee-jerk reaction to playing to a cliche so can you walk me through a process with a given character or even a hypothetical character, how you would, how you would go about doing that? Cause I think that's, that's fascinating. And yeah. I've never heard that before. Let me think of something specific. So I'm not blowing smoke. Give me a second. If, if I handed you the script of star Wars and you saw Luke Skywalker, what's, what's the known, what's the unknown and what's the un, unknowable about him? Is that what you said? No, Let's no. take Jaws. Jaws is easier. If okay. you don't mind. Like, so go for it. So Jaws is about a shark that's terrorizing a small village, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and Chief Brody brings it to the attention of the mayor of the town. But the mayor of the town is hesitant to do anything because it falls before Labor Day weekend, and he's con- concerned about economics, right? So that's your statement, counterstatement. But mm-hmm. the resolution is Chief Brody's got to go out and do it on his own. Chief Brody's got to overcome his fears of the ocean and go out there and take care of it. So it's really, what's the truth? It's, it's commerce, right? It's about economics being more important than maybe human safety. Yeah. Um, so what's what's the subtext? What's, what's the right way to shoot that, right? You shoot a lot of action scenes, maybe you shoot a lot of jib shots, but what do they do? They locked it off on the boat. That camera's always locked off on the boat. It's never handheld. It's very static. Yeah. And you're always rocking with those characters. I don't know if that was a subtextual decision, though. I think it was a decision based on not making people seasick. Yeah. Also, I think a lot of, I think, I mean, like Jaws is one of those movies to me that like almost just kind of comes out of the primordial ooze. <laughs> like I can't imagine a world without Jaws. It's, it's, it's such an elemental movie. But when you hear about how they made it, it was like everything got fucked up on that movie and yeah. and, and, and they were yeah. chasing their tails and the shark didn't work or whatever. And, you know, like that movie almost killed Spielberg, you know, and, and you look at it and it's such a masterpiece and you wouldn't change a frame of it, but it was not, it, it, it wasn't necessarily. Right. It wasn't ordained that way. They didn't have that sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Story. I mean, I think that he had the command of the visual language in that way, mm-hmm. obviously. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> but I feel like a lot of it was just making the best out of a bad situation and then in, inventing a blockbuster. So I guess I'll talk about the project I'm working on now that I'm trying to hash out. It's about a, an agoraphobic, about a man okay. kind of stuck in his house and stuck in his own world. So I'm thinking. One eight five would be the proper aspect ratio for that. It's a little more confined than two three nine. Yeah, you know you're a little shut in, and I'm thinking about maybe vignetting a lot too. You know, keep, like like things are closing in on him. Yeah, and even like in in resolve and post, maybe bringing some very subtle vignettes, just making it feel claustrophobic. Yeah, um, and so your moves, I don't think it's a handheld movie. You know, I think it's very static, very you know stationary. Um, and as far as lighting is concerned, I think we're still discovering the lighting, but I think it's going to be about revealing who this character is over time. So I don't think it's ever going to be broad, soft lighting. I think it's going to be a lot of half lighting and three quarter lighting and revealing that character through the three act structure. Yeah. And and so the last version of the script I saw was very much like a Paul Schrader film. It's kind of like a guy going down his own rabbit hole. Um, and he's got a lot of conflict. No, the thought, and I haven't really gone through this with the director yet. But I think it's it's interesting to even discuss what the thought process is. I mean, the the dialectic stuff is interesting, and I feel like I feel like I must have been taught that in film school because I remember. Well, here's the thing: it's so much easier as a director, right? Let's yeah. talk about a scene where a man's caught cheating on his wife, right? Yeah. So the knee jerk reaction is like he walks in, she's mad and yelling at him. But maybe the more clever way to play that scene is she's cool as ice. Yeah. Doesn't that give her a lot more dimension? Definitely. And instead of him feeling guilty, maybe he accuses her of like driving him to that. Like he puts it on her because maybe this is what she really wanted in the end. Maybe that's the resolution to the dialectical statement. Like she got what she wanted. Yeah. So how can she be mad? And when you, and when you laid it out, you said there's the known, the unknown and the unknowable. There's the said, the oh. unsaid and the unsayable. 
I was close. That's that comes from Robert McKee. So I'll save you three thousand dollars or whatever it is. <laughs> I've read the book, but man, it's a good book. book. I a, like it. It's a heavy tome. Um, you know, of all like the script gurus out there, I do like Robert McKee because I feel like he eschews any formula. You know, I don't think he wants to be a formula. I think he's really genuinely concerned about storytelling, and I think that plays into like the collective unconscious and how we tell stories and it goes back to Joseph Campbell and all that big time. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that you're bringing that up because you know, most people when they, you know, when we talk about cinematography, they think about, you know, what lens, what light, but really, you know, once you get past that, once that's just the background noise in your process, it's like, well, how is this telling a story? What are we doing? How are we constructing a story using these tools? Yeah. Cause I don't think you want a cool shot at the end of the day. I think you want something that sticks with people. Yeah. Well, there's a difference between, uh, and I'll name, I'll name shit, uh, you know, like Alfonso Cuaron in Children of Men doing these crazy long, long takes that are extremely suspenseful and artistic or whatever, and then go to McGee making Terminator Salvation, who's doing very artistic, interesting long takes, but they kind of feel showy. Like they feel like, holy crap, I, I can't believe the camera hasn't cut yet. Whereas <laughs> in Children of Men, it's like, holy shit, how's he going to get like, I'm lost in the story. I'm yeah, not thinking I, about I it. agree. And it's funny. I think I saw that movie and because I'm a cameraman, everybody's like, what'd you think about that long take? And I'm like, I didn't even realize it was in there <laughs> because I'm just so locked into the story. I love that movie. Yeah. And I think when you're serving the narrative, you're not even aware of the takes. That's why I have to turn the sound off. Oh, interesting. To analyze a film. I'm sure you do too. I, you know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I probably should, but I don't. I mean, that's very basic. Like a film that always kind of escaped my, I knew there was a lot going on that I wasn't getting was Casablanca. Cause I think there's something like five subplots going on in that. Oh yeah. And I love that film. I've watched it probably a dozen times. I try not to watch it too much cause I like it and I want to keep it precious. But when you turn the sound off, there's like a legend. There's like a key. There's like a guide you can unlock. And then it makes a lot of sense to me. Really? Well, Here's actually that's a great way to shoot a low budget film is use Casablanca, right? So here's a film that's a talker, and it's largely in Rick's tavern, right? Rick's yeah. cafe. There's a few exteriors, a few other cutaways, but not much. So what do they do? They make it super interesting, right? You've got all this backlighting going on. You've got the shadows interplaying with the characters. You've got the shadows of the fans, and people are wearing stripes. So they feel like inmates. They can't get out of Casablanca unless they get the uh, what is it called the the letters of transit, right? Yeah. So they're locked in there. They're basically in purgatory. You see all this smoke. And then what do you have to keep it even more sexy and more appealing to the eye? You have the searchlights going on, breaking up the frame. So to me, that's the ultimate way to do a low-budget film is do Casablanca. I'll get right on that. That's smart. Yeah, and then do it in black and white. (laughs) Yeah, I'm ashamed to say I haven't watched Casablanca. God, I haven't seen it in a long time. I love that film. I think, you know, everybody says, oh, um, Citizen Kane's the greatest American movie. Uh I, I think there's a strong argument that. I think they're both great. I think they both hold up. I mean, Greg Toland is phenomenal, and to see what he was doing so early on is really my. I saw Citizen Kane actually uh, like a block away from here at the Cinerama Dome, probably about a year and a half ago, Mm. and I had I had seen it on the big screen when they did like the I think it was the fiftieth anniversary re-release or something, but it was the first time I'd seen it since then. And you just don't even realize how groundbreaking that movie is. And I know it's it is kind of the most cliche thing to talk about Citizen Kane, but it just invented so much of what we still do today and Orson Welles after that doesn't get his due in my opinion you know you even look at stuff like Touch of Evil and just the the genius level work that he was like what he was doing was so much better than the material he was given so much of the time and it's it's, it's such a bummer I was reading actually that his last movie uh, what what's it called um I know but they're going to reassemble it, reassemble it right yeah yeah they're yeah. finally getting it out of purgatory yeah they're finally like we're going to get to see it and I feel like it's going to come out so dated I've seen footage they, they have yeah. some footage from it it's going to be outrageously dated and weird looking. You know, it, I think it's going to probably look a lot like his documentary F for fake. Mm-hmm. Have you ever listened to the Bogdanovich tapes? No. They're like six hours of interviews over like a 10 year period with him and Orson. They're phenomenal. No, he's, he's, he's really just an, it's an, it's an amazing and tragic story. Yeah. But, um, you know, and obviously you, you don't have the same level of tragedy with the people behind Casablanca, but that, that is, that is an interesting thing to think about and, and to kind of decode that movie a little bit. So, okay, so it's the said, the unsaid, and the unsayable. <laughs> oh, just, God, I'm going to go down as a guy. The, no, the no, I, I, I know. I, I think, no, but I, you, you see, like, to me, this is this is kind of the, um, this is the brass ring. If I can figure out what how somebody looks at a pile of words at a script and turns that into pictures. Well, and everybody has a different process and everybody goes through it a different way. But I feel like 
that's the thing that it doesn't matter what the technology turns into in 10 years or whatever like that like that is to me it's one it, that's the black art here that's the technique it's not a technique it's 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 a it's part technique it's part creative inspiration it's part you know a lot of times your your decisions are made for you because you get hired on a job and it's like yeah you're shooting in this building or this set or you know you're given a style guide so so much of mm-hmm. what you can do is already gone but if but if you're working on a micro budget feature and somebody gives you this script and says you know like how do how do i make this how do i make this cinema and not yeah you know um nothing against you know mumblecore but you know how do do i make this cinema that's transcendent and uh and reaches people and and you don't have to have techno cranes and you don't have to have all this gear to do it but how how do you do it and how you know so to me this is this is what's fascinating to hear this is this is the most interesting thing that i can that anyone can tell me well i think that what we're both driving at is theme yeah i've never found another cameraman who agrees with me but I think I need this to define the theme of the film. And then that informs everything. You know, if the theme is love conquers all, whatever, it's going to, it's really going to form what filters I choose and what lenses. And yeah. is this going to be a beautiful film? Is it going to be a stark film? Is it going to be docu, verite, Italian neorealism? Yeah. Where, where's it going to fall under? And then that, that makes my job much easier, I think. Well, some of it also, I think is like, well, and I guess this is really theme too, I guess in a sense, but it's like, um, uh, it's a point of view. Like, have you seen a uh, Nightcrawler, the Dan Gilroy? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that Dude, mo- Okay, so I think you ask who's your favorite cinematographer? Yeah. Bob Ellsworth. Oh, he's a, you, yeah, you, you can't go wrong with him. Yeah. Nobody films L.A. like that guy. But you look at that movie, and I've heard Dan Gilroy talk about that movie a great deal, and he says it's a success story. This movie is a success yeah, story. Yeah. And it's filmed like a success story. And I feel like that's part of why it's so dark is that it gets you on the point. It gets the audience to, uh, to, to go along with the bad guy. Or to go along with a bad guy well, who has, is the protagonist. He has this, he has a defendable point of view. Yeah. And he executes it, you know? Yeah. I mean, to, to a point that's, you know, ludicrous, but but he's going to be a success in what he chooses to do. And I guess that is sort of a thematic underpinning because I feel like if if you're given that script, if I gave you the script to Nightcrawler and I said, we want to film this, you know, but I but the main guy is the bad guy and I want to make him look bad and evil and scary, you would do it differently than it was done which is they make him look like the good guy. He's kind of like a motivational coach from the 80s. He is. And almost everything he says sounds like something that you would hear from like a sales program or something. Exactly, exactly. Without naming names. Um, <laughs> no, and I think the same thing with uh, a previous film Bob Ellsworth did, which is why I'm such a fan of his. I love his collaborations with uh, P.T. Anderson. Oh, God, yes. But um, There Will Be Blood. I mean, that is the triumph of capitalism over religion, right? This, yeah. this country is founded, I'm not getting into politics, but you know, under the idea of freedom of religion, right? But I think it, it was quickly decided that we're really a capitalist country. And I think that was the, the thesis of that film or the theme. Yeah. And it starts with Daniel Day-Lewis, Daniel Day-Lewis climbing out of that primordial ooze, right? Yeah. In the guts to shoot anamorphic photochemically at those dim exposures with just enough light for you to see him crawling out of that it was just amazing. And then the conclusion of that movie was the natural conclusion. It was just the ultimate right move. I mean, that I'm not going to talk about it for anybody who's not seen it. I think we all I know. I sort it. of feel like if you haven't seen There Will Be Blood and you're listening to this podcast, you need to get out more often. So that that brutal beating at the end was really, I think, P.T. Anderson's statement of, of who won out over capitalism versus religion. Yeah. So, yeah, that's lighting for theme. That's blocking for theme. Interesting. My humble opinion. Bob might come on this podcast and say, Bill doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. He can go back to shooting Beauty Queen murders and, <laughs> and he would have every, have every right to say that. And I would not be able to disagree with him. No, well, but but I do, well, I mean, I think that when you're dealing with a writer-director like P.T. Anderson too, like he's got such strong control over over that kind of stuff. I mean, I feel like like when you watch Boogie Nights within the movie itself, he kind of, he gives you the arc of the character as an audience member. He sucks you in with the glamour of of this porn industry in the seventies. And by the end you feel like you have a venereal disease just watching the movie, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so candy coated and glossy. I mean that, that coming of age, you know, it's yeah. almost like a coming of age film in the beginning. I mean, it's like a dysfunctional family film. And, and also like with a huge homage to raging bull and you realize like at the end, like even the framing of him in the dressing room is right out of raging bull. You know, you're right. I never thought of that. And it kind of is 
it's a little bit like a fighting movie. It's a little bit like a sports movie where, yeah. you know, like he yeah. has the ups and downs of a sports figure. He's just a porn star. I never heard that take. That's really cool. Oh, I don't think I made that up. But uh, I like that, though. That's Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. You know, and and like you were saying, like those steady cam moves around the pool and then going into the pool. Oh, yeah. I feel it maybe was a little stylish, but in a way that totally went with the the. Yeah, like the theme of the film. I mean, well, it earned the life it, it earned the style. You can't just like watch. I mean, to me, I guess that's the difference between what I'm saying, like the Children of Men long takes versus the Terminator Salvation long yeah. takes. Not 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 to take anything away from Terminator Salvation. You know, it's fine for what it is, and I enjoyed it, and I paid to see it in the theater. But but like I will, I saw it once, and I never need to see it again. Children of Men is one of those movies that I revisit over and over again, and it's because it's a movie that earned this this crazy thing that it was doing. Um, and it wasn't just doing it to do it. It was doing it because it actually anchored you in the story in an interesting way, you know, kind of like how, you know, yeah, anyone can tell a story backwards, but Memento figured out a way to earn how to do that. And, and so it took you, th- it took, it put you in the protagonist point of view of, you don't remember what happened before either. Um, and, and you know, that I, I think a lot can be said about like, whatever your style is, you kind of have to earn it. Even if your even if your style is flat, boring coverage, you know, ma- master and overs, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to even say there were a few good dogma 95 films. I mean, and the celebration, the, the celebration made me cry party. like a little, like a little baby. I mean, like that movie was, it was one of the saddest things I ever saw. Yeah, and, and I'm a fan of breaking the waves. I mean. Some people hate it. Some people think it's really... I can't go there with you, but I understand why people like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I I kind of feel that style fits that film. Yeah. Oh, the style definitely fits the film. And Lars von Trier, definitely, you know, like masterful filmmaker. I would argue sometimes he uses his powers for good and sometimes for evil, but... I'd say we all do. <laughs> we should all do it more often. So so let's talk a little bit more about, about your work moving forward. So so you, uh, you do the TV guide thing. You do um, the AOL thing. Do you hit a breaking point with that? I mean, I guess you're still doing some of that stuff, but do you make a conscious decision to move in a more cinematic direction? Yeah, you know, I had a you know one of those life reevaluating moments. If my 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 parents got sick, and you know, I had to go home and kind of manage the family oh. affairs, and Yee. and then you know, I came back. I was going I was out of LA for two years. Oh wow! Yeah, and I didn't work, and I came back, and I really you know, evaluated where I was and what I was doing. And yes, I was successful. My business was earning money and I was keeping the lights on. But um, I took a really hard look and I, you know, I'm not a 30 year old anymore. You know, I've been doing this for 17 years. I'm like, really, where do I want to end up? And where did I start out wanting to do? And I really decided to let go a lot of my clients and it really cost me dearly financially. But there's something magical that happens. I think George Lucas is quoted as saying, you know, the power, most powerful thing you can say in Hollywood is no. Mm-hmm. No, I won't take Jar Jar out of the movie. <laughs> very powerful. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, it's very true when you invest in yourself. I mean, I've never been promoted in, by anybody but myself. Like, I just decided I'm not a very good camera assistant. But I had a sense that I'd be an okay camera operator. And so when I decided to be a camera operator, I, I got camera operating gigs. But nobody came up to me and said, Bill, we're going to promote you to camera operator. Um, so... Nobody's taken me out of that ENG world and said, we're going to drop you into the cinema world. Uh, but I decided to take myself out of the ENG world. And I just decided I'm no, I'm no longer doing red carpets. I'm doing very limited interviews. I mean, when we shoot a documentary, you have to do interviews. So I'll do those. Um, but I won't do junkets and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that first year, I got three feature documentaries my first year. Um, I had a lot of time off in between and I made far less you know, I earned far less money than I did previous to that, but I was much more fulfilled. And yeah. so it's it's kind of an experiment. I'm still in that experiment. You know, I'm going to see if it's sustif- if it's sustainable. Um, I get I really get a lot of inspiration by attending you know breakfasts at the ASC, and you hear ASC members kind of do the same thing. They just decided to believe in themselves, and they took a lot of time off, and they didn't work a lot uh, until they booked that gig that got them some notice. Um, How many years has it been since you came back? Uh, it was like mid 2000, it was actually late 2011. Oh, so relatively recently. Yeah. I'm still experimenting. Um, so last year I did the three feature docs and this year, um, talk about the the docs. Sure. They were great. I really loved it. Um, the first one I did was in Philadelphia for, um, it was on, uh, an organization, it was for an organization known as the Sons of Ben. It started out as being six guys and they turned into 6,000 people. 
and they convinced Major League Soccer to give Philadelphia the last sports, uh, the last franchise in Major League Soccer, known as the Union. And it's this little comeuppance story. And they built it in Chester, Pennsylvania, which is a really depressed area. And so there's a lot of heartfelt stories that came out of that. I didn't know anything about soccer. I didn't know anything about Philly. I just had a great time learning about it and shooting it. And uh, we shot with the F3 in S-Log, exposed perfectly, you know, to the S-Log white papers. So I wasn't monkeying around with the look. And I'm really confident that's going to look really great. And and then we did really get uh, the chance to apply subtext. And we went into the ghettos and the barrios. And, well, barrios is right. You can cut that out. There's no barrios yeah. in Philly. But we went into, like, the depressed areas of Chester. And we talked to those people. And we talked about their loss and... You know, people had sons that aspired to be soccer players and got killed and hold up and holds up, got killed and hold ups in Seven Eleven. So there's a lot of heart to that film. It was really interesting. Hmm. And uh, at the same time, I was shooting this makers uh, program for PBS and AOL, and that was really I was proud of that. Even though it's a lot of interviews, it's really uplifting. Yeah. The most uplifting one, or the most challenging one, was we went to uh, um, this woman down in Mississippi named Heather McTeer, who was running against an incumbent. She was a woman running against a man, and she was African American. So, this woman was re- receiving death threats for running against an incumbent. She, she was receiving rape threats because she was a woman, and people were threatening to kill her because she was black. So, I, you know, you have to admire somebody's courage like that. I mean, you really realize you're not in Kansas anymore, and that <laughs> the country is really different in different parts of the world. You know. And you like went to Mississippi to in, to interview her. Yeah. So that was one of the ones that uh, I guess what we were talking about referencing earlier where we get to use our powers for good instead of yeah. evil. And, you know, uh, yeah, that lighting that I learned back at the entertainment came totally into play there. And this <laughs> woman is an attractive woman, a woman, but, um, you know, I use some, some tricks to really make her pop and look attractive and look as good on camera as she looks in person. Cool. And, uh, there were, there were how many other you, you did, you said you did four. Oh gosh. Of those, uh, well, I probably did 30, 40 makers. Because they're little snippets. But yeah, I did three feature docs last year. Three feature docs. Yeah, so I did Sons of Ben. Then I did, um, this is a crazy one. We did a a thing called Art of Burning, which was on Burning Man. I think I've heard of that one. Well, it's not released yet, but maybe Ilya mentioned it. But um, a friend of mine named Arno Paris is a director, and he's a fantastic stereographer. And uh, he owns a buttload of epics. And uh, he wanted to do this, this, this high frame rate, 3D, IMAX approved documentary on Burning Man. None of those words belong in the same sentence. Seriously. Yeah. And that was really. High frame rate and Burning Man can go together. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. But think about how many terabytes of information we're going through. Oh, good. Shooting Lord, in yeah. 3D. Yeah. Now double the frame rate. Mm-hmm. We're shooting at 48 frames per second. So it was, it was insane. Um, I'd never been to Burning Man either. <laughs> I would be afraid to take a really good camera to Burning Man because you just hear that everybody comes back so covered with. Yeah. find dust that like all your clothes are ruined and yeah, everything. Yeah, exactly. I and we had uh, 24 people on our crew. We had a multinational crew. We had Italians coming in because one of the producers was Italian providing the money. So the stereographers, camera assistants, rig techs, key grip, and DIT were Italian. The 3D aerial team was French. We didn't use a multi-rotor craft. We used this thing called a Soul Cam, mm-hmm. which is about 20 feet in diameter, helium balloon. And the reason for using that is because we didn't want to kick up dust and we didn't want anybody to hear us. Oh. Because, you know, we're trying to sell ourselves to the black, well, I think it's called something like the Burning Man Conservancy. I'm not sure what it is, but they're very particular about who they allow in and who they allow to film there. And so we had to appease them. And so at great expense, uh, Arnaud flew in this French team and, and bought helium, which is really expensive for this. And so the only doc I've ever heard of doing three, I'm sure there's plenty of 3d documentaries, but the only one I ever saw in theaters was the cave of forgotten dreams by Werner Herzog. And, uh, that was very interesting, but I kept thinking like, how do you do it? Like, like, I feel like, you know, in documentary generally, you're wanting to change the situation you're in as little as possible. But how do you do that when you're like, Oh wait, well, you know, let's calculate the interocular distance yeah, and blah, blah, blah. It, it Did was, you have to, were you constantly focusing on that kind of stuff? Yes. <laughs> and, and the convergence and all that stuff yep. and and sinking shutters yeah and gear <sighs> gear malfunctioning constantly because that alkaline dust is rotting it as it's attaching itself to it <sighs> it was the most technically challenging thing I've ever done in my life really I took this point of view that I was a a well-known DP I said how would Vilmos Zygmunt shoot this he wouldn't yeah. go in and be setting the convergence and sinking the shutters yeah he would have his rig tech he would just have the bird's eye view and maintain the artistic 
point of view of a DP. And I just said, I'm going to cast myself in the role of this well-known DP because I, I had such a large crew and there was so much crazy stuff going on that I couldn't micromanage it at that point. Yeah. I just had to be the author of the images, if you will. And, and it was, a, it was, a, it was a, what I learned from Burning Man is how to manage a crew, how to keep them on board for the length of a, like a three-week project under a lot of duress, and how to maintain the artistic quality of it without being a hands-on. Usually I'm working at such a low budget that... I'm the guy setting the key pro mini on my yeah. camera and you know, I'm downloading the images and I'm setting lights maybe even, but on this one I just had to delegate all that and trust trust the people around me and they they excelled and they had my back. Um but yeah, that was a tough one because we lost a lot of gear on that, as you would imagine. Dust got gets into everything. We had a crew at night just blowing stuff out with compressors. Oof. Um the first day we lost our HMIs. <laughs> The second day, we lost our uh, follow our wireless follow focus units, follow focus units. A couple of days after that, we started losing our sync devices. Um, after that, my lenses started going down one at a time. Oh no! And that takes out a set because I need a stereo matched. I need two lenses. Oh to match. man! And that ain't cheap too when you start getting to lenses. Do you want to hear a heartbreaker? Oh yes. So, in Spain, they found two sets of beautiful super speeds that had been put away since the nineties. They mm -hmm. were in a television station that converted over to digital or I guess to electronic cameras. And at that point they put away their super speeds. So they unearthed them and they brought them to us. And I'm like, guys, we can't take these lenses out to the desert. So I wouldn't say they got ruined. They can be clean. They can be taken apart and clean, but it was just a heartbreaker when you start seeing dirt inside, like beautiful as ice super speeds and yeah. the coating. I mean, the coatings were fine. The barrels were fine. It was just, you know, a lot of pollution inside of it. Oof. And then our Optimo started going down. So we started having to shoot with EOS lenses. You know, it was just like, what's going to go down next? Like shooting stereo with EOS lenses? Like is the quality control on them? No, it's fine because what you do is you just sent, you set everything. You set your focus distance exactly the same. You set your convergence the same. Yeah. And so in a documentary and a rig that's 75 pounds, you're not like trucking forward and backwards. I guess that's, what is that? A Z axis? Yeah. We did have the original slider, like we had an eight foot slider. We could go left and right with it. And so if I set my depth of field around a four, I had enough to carry it, you know, for that, that length of the move. So we'd always have two cameras with us, or sorry, two rigs with us. Um, so we had one on the six foot slider or eight foot slider, and then we had one stationary locked off. So how, how big is the camera rig that you're working on? We, uh, we had three rigs, uh, all of them, the Reality Technica. We had the the Atom, and we have the had the Quasar. And the Quasar is quite large. Um, is that the one where you have one facing forward and one looking down into yeah, a mirror? Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're both like that, but one's just bigger than the other. And the Quasar is the earlier version, and quite big and heavy, definitely north of 50 pounds, maybe hovering in the 75-pound range. It was really tough. And then the Atom... So again, not a lot of handheld. None. Well, that's not true. Actually, I'm going to shout out to Arno. He has a magnesium rig that he uh, had custom built at great expense where you can do handheld 3D with two epics. Nice. Yeah. And so he used that to walk through the crowds. And that's that's one of the things that'll make that that piece unique. That and I think that soul can that we were talking about. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that was a challenge. The one thing that never went down and never got polluted with dirt was were the red cameras. The one really? Thing, yeah. The one thing I had heard that I might want to be aware of because they kind of have an open design to allow, allow heat out we never, never had a problem with them. Interesting. Yeah. We had seven bodies to protect ourselves and we never had a problem with them. We huh. never, we never lost a file. No file got corrupted. Um, the only thing, yeah, like I said, everything else went down with us. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. So shout out to Red. So what was the third feature doc? The third was, um, I just did this thing for Sky Movies UK for BBC on uh, Disney Animation Studios. And I thought going in, I'm just going to do a lot of interviews and blah, blah, blah. It's going to be boring. Uh, but it's the type of thing where I went in, I didn't really know what I was in for. It blew my mind. I, I interviewed every living director of every animated movie that Disney's done since um, The Little Mermaid. So are you directing and shooting this? No, no, it's just, no, there was no director, just just okay. a producer, um, uh, but I was DPing it, and uh, we're shooting a shooting on F900, believe it or not. Because, uh, yeah. Really? They, yeah, they wanted, I think they wanted 50i. I mean, it was what, the uh, company that hired me got their hands on. So 
still a gorgeous looking camera. Yeah. Um, it's it's unwieldy compared to cameras today. Um, but um, yeah, that that documentary was really eye opening to be at Disney Animation Studios and see how they break down a script and break down a character and to be in the presence of every living director and they're sitting there animating for me and doing voices for me. Oh and wow! We went into the Disney Animation Archive and saw every single cell that they have preserved. I mean, you see the development of Pinocchio. You know, yeah. I mean, they they the guy comes out with the white gloves and you're in the vault. And it's like, I guess it's acetone, plastic, or paper it's behind. And he breaks out the cells and he shows you the development of a character. It's, That's it's, crazy. And I just did, uh, uh, in addition to that, an addendum to that, uh, just last week, we were doing, we were covering Big Hero 6 and they're adding it to that documentary. And oh, cool. what I learned Disney does is they make their animators, one thing they ask them to do is animate every character just walking into a diner and sitting down. How does this person enter a room? And what a great way to develop character. Because every character has his own attitude, yeah. his own way of walking in, his own way, his point of view of the world. So, well, animators in a sense are actors, you know, like they have to, they're performers. It's it's very interesting to me. I've I've done a little bit of work in animation, mostly in editing, and and uh, it's a completely different mindset than every than anything else I've ever done. And the people who are really great at it are, you know, just the blow your mind with their insight and the way that these things work. Yeah, the lighting of those films you can learn a lot from uh, anime. Or Disney films or Pixar films about lighting, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and character development, obviously, and and blocking. Oh yeah, well, I think that that's something. I feel like when you watch like a Robert Zemeckis movie, it's not surprising to me that Robert Zemeckis has gotten so involved in animation, because you know, go back and watch Back to the Future and look at the way he designs a sequence. You know, like the way it builds and creates a new obstacle and everything like that, and it's not. It's never coverage. I mean, I, I'm sure that he shoots whole bits of, of stuff from the same c- camera angle or whatever, but he's, I, I'm, I'm always in awe of, uh, even, even as a Mechas movie I don't particularly love, I'll still watch it and I'm just in awe of how he's constructed the sequence. It's not, it's not, he doesn't hose down a scene, you know, like mm-hmm. point three cameras at it and just shoot everything. Spray it's like and pray. every, <laughs> it's everything is really specific and and I, like I feel like if I could get Robert Zemeckis to sit here, he'd say, "Oh, composition, completely composition." Of course, he's the director, yeah. but you know, like the way he composes the, a frame or the way he moves the camera and how it forwards the story, and it's all about the story. Yeah, I was just reading the the issue of ASC dedicated to Gordon Willis, and he kind of was the same way. He was always kind of building sequences in his blocking. Yeah, like you might have somebody on camera, but you'd carry somebody's shoulder in the foreground, and then you come around and do a reveal of who that person was. You'd always yeah. put something that was pertinent or germane to the story into into your blocking or into your composition. Yeah, learned a lot from that that uh that episode of AC, ASC. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you know, and, and with animation and that this is sort of what I learned when I was doing some editing of animation is that's all they do is sequence design. You know, mm-hmm. and that's not all they do obviously, but like, you know, like when they're when they're boarding it out, mm-hmm. the way that you board out something in animation is very different than the way you would board it out in live action necessarily. But um, but it's in both cases, it's about designing the sequence. And in the animation world, you don't have to worry about can we get a camera up here? Or can we, you know, can, how are yeah. we going to light this or that? Mm-hmm. It's like you just you know you're making it all up so you can put it wherever you want it. And in the CGI world, I think you know it takes time to rig and like you know that you have to like if you're if you're going to shoot under this table you have to build the texture under that Mm -hmm. and that takes time and takes render time and all that stuff yeah but uh but you know there's there's just something kind of amazing to trying to like to me that's kind of a a weird place where the art of the director and the art of the dp kind of overlap a lot and if you're working with a dp you know you you're going to lean on them a lot i think when it when it comes to building those sequences there is a philosophical debate going on is are we redefining the role of the cinematographer now? Is he no longer just the director of photography? Can he now be considered a director of imagery? Mm-hmm. You know, like you were mentioning Deacon's uh, contributing to Wally before. And I think a lot of that lighting is now they're trying to ground it in reality and real physics. Um, one thing I learned on frozen is their software is really grounded in physics and people would do a particular move and their clothes would fly off because that's what would happen in the real world. So they actually had to decide when to break the rules of physics just to entertain the audience. I think I am, I almost think that you should do it. You should be forced to make an animatic in film school hmm. because it forces you to think like a sequence. You know, you look at the old silent movies like Buster Keaton movies hmm. or whatever, and you see like those people 
all they had was the sequence. They didn't have sound. They didn't have the kind of special effects that we have. They didn't have the ways to move the camera that we have, but they could build a, a motherfucking sequence like nobody's business, yeah, you know, yeah. Charlie Chaplin. Or mm-hmm. when you look at somebody like Guillermo del Toro or somebody like I was saying earlier, like the, there's there's a such a um, such an intentional construction there. You look at somebody like Paul Greengrass, there's an intentional construction in the blocking, and I'm sure that there's an intentional construction in like where they put those cameras, but they're just... They, everything he does is hosing it down. No, I would, you know, just to, I beg to differ a little bit. I would say that's called zone coverage, Mm -hmm. you know, where, where they know where the action is going to fall, but we're not locked into marks. Right. Yeah. Because we know anything with action is really highly, um, has been blocked out, has been rehearsed. Yeah. So I would just say they're doing zone coverage. Oh, of course. I'm not, I'm not, I love Paul Greengrass work or, uh, you know, Peter Berg, like, like, uh, was that movie he did last year? Lone survivor. Oh, I didn't see that one. Yeah. I saw the one before that. The, um, the one on the battleship, destroy, yeah, battleship the Michael, <laughs> I don't know the battleship Mann necessarily. Tribute. I don't know that that's that that would be in the Peter Berg canon. It's an homage to yeah. Michael Mann, not <laughs> Michael Mann, Michael Bay, <laughs> Michael Bay, Michael Bay, homage worthy. Um, no, but what, well, but if you look at, I mean, even if you look at any of his mainstream movies like Hancock or whatever, but but you know, look at any Peter Berg movie, uh, Friday Night Lights, I think, is the best example. And it's like uh, what I heard, and I don't know if this is true, is that like they do the scene, they, they they'll do it a bunch of times. And he'll have like three or four cameramen, and every time they cut, they he just rearranges the cameras, so he gets a lot of those just mm-hmm. perfect moments where so and so sits down, and you're focused on the background, and you pull it right to them, right at the exact mm-hmm. moment it would happen that you couldn't really plan. You know, it would it would feel inorganic to plant to plan it out that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's trying to get kind of a documentary feel, and that's what Paul Greengrass is doing. Um, and I, I I shouldn't say he's hosing it down, but uh, but you're right, it it is a zone thing, but I feel like those kinds of movies are constructed in post. Like they get a lot of coverage. I really respect Paul Greengrass. I think he probably designs that as part of his aesthetic. Oh yeah. No, you it's, know? it's a method. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, I mean, it, it's very, very designed. I just think that the movie itself is often found like he's creating a way for him to find the exact yeah. coverage in post. Yeah. Yeah, it's very verite. It feels in the yeah. now like like you're experiencing it with them, I guess. And he comes from a documentary background, so it makes perfect sense. But I'd like to see him do a a narrative film where, in more in the traditional sense, and see how he plays that. Yeah, has he done that? Greengrass? No, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, so that was 2013. That was it was all about docs. Every year is different for me. You know, I don't have a trajectory. Every year is different. One year I did commercials. One year I did docs. I did a lot of rock and roll, and you know. So what's this year? This year was cable recreations. Oh, what for? Um, one was for investigation discovery, beauty mm-hmm. queen murders, um, which is about a beauty queen who's been murdered, or in one case, a beauty queen who was a murderer. Um, and that came with a style manual, and we had to emulate what they did last season. Mm-hmm. For some reason, they parted ways with their DP last year, and it was fun, it was a really fantastic look. So we had to emulate that. What kind of things would be in a style manual? Well. This this one didn't come with a style manual. It just came with um, all the links to the shows, and they said it had to look like that. Okay. Which meant that the lead actress, the beauty queen, had to look good at all times. And of had course. to have, she was kind of like lit above key and was filtered and kind of had like a kind of a warm golden backlight. Um, we pushed that look a little bit. Um, we found that they liked it a lot. We would, um, there were these party scenes that were mandatory where we're kind of doing a coming out party. We're introducing the character. So I'd always have my gaffer with an LED torch firing down the barrel of, of the cabrio that I had on the lens or on the camera. And we'd have these flares and we'd shoot, be shooting at 60 or 90 frames a second. We found that the producers really loved that. It was kind of like, you know, a character's entrance. You want to make a, a big... Yeah. You know, you know, and, what size crew were you working with on, on the reenactments? It was pretty small. I had a three-ton truck. I had um, myself, a first AC, gaffer, electrician, uh, best boy type, swing type. And a DIT. So it was six or seven people and a B camera, depending. So it was about eight guys. And what camera were you shooting on? Uh, we were shooting Sony F55s. Oh, nice. And I just went with Fuji Cabrios. One thing they said they didn't like last year is they were shooting on Cooks last year, which are gorgeous lenses, but they were like kind of frustrated. Best. Yeah. But they were kind of frustrated with stopping down and taking the map box off and swapping lenses. And it seemed to me like they wanted to do a lot of setups. And so I just suggested the Fuji Cabrios. They're really fast, really sharp, mm-hmm. very neutral looking. Um, so we went with that and I think I put Schneider filters, uh, classic softs in front of that. And, um, and then we had a really cool lights, you know, we had a, you know, HMI package and, um, I think I brought in a Joe Lico, which is a lot of fun to use. Very versatile lens. Uh, had some gobos designed for that, uh, just to speed things along. It could be 
viewed as a little cheesy, but it was a time saver. Like I had a window pattern cut out. I had a breakup pattern. I had a tree pattern, just stuff that we can. But you need that kind of stuff for reenactments. You know, you need to get your idea across very quickly. Yeah, especially with a small crew, you know. It's just a time saver. Um, we did a lot of low light stuff, you know, because there's murder scenes. We did a dude. We did a murder scene in a real church. And that was really, yeah, sweet. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the sad things. I learned this. I did a homicide investigation show a few years ago too, and on the first one, which was called uh, Solved, it was all about uh, murders that get solved. I had a lot of fun because I, I pushed to make it look like Friday the Thirteenth, like horror films, like big backlight through the trees and smoke and. I'd have like a killer smoking in a car and beating somebody up and killing them. But then I did the interviews out on the road and I realized this, this, this really happened to somebody. And it was really, it really affected me. You know, mm-hmm. It really made me depressed that I had joy in my art, but somebody had to suffer and die, you know, in order for me to um, work on this show. So I was always kind of respectful in Beauty Queen Murders being that somebody, somebody died at the hands of another and I'm shooting this. And so... The one in the church was really dark because this young priest like bludgeoned somebody with a candlestick. Jesus. Yeah. And so we Literally. had to recreate that on the altar of a real church. So the, the church was okay with that? Yeah. You know, um, I think in the end, you know, we were, we were the, the crime was solved like 30 years later. And it was always kind of like, I hate this word, it's a pop psychology word, but there is closure at the end of these. Yeah. And I, def- I think it's good for the families that there's closure and they do reveal the killer at the end, they, his name and his face. And so, um, yeah, I mean, so that's a challenge working with a small crew, lighting a giant church, you know, yeah, and getting yeah. moods across. But I learned so much. It was like shooting a independent feature every week. Um, so I really actually enjoyed those. And so now you're moving into shooting this micro budget feature. Yeah. And so I think like we can carry a lot of that. In fact, I'll take some of the crew with me and, and carry a lot of those same uh, practices along. And so how much of, of like, you know, because you, there's obviously a lot of twists and turns in, in what your career has, has been yeah. and you've done a lot of different things. How much of this are you guiding? How, how much of this is intentional? Are, Cause you know, you said like at a certain point you said, I'm not going to be an AC anymore or I'm not going to, you know, uh, I, I just need to be an operator. So at a certain point, you know, you, you decided to get out of ENG style stuff even though you know periodically you'll, you'll pick up the occasional job but um but it's not your focus and so now you're going to do a micro budget feature are you are you trying to kind of turn the focus to doing more narrative straight up narrative yeah and i think you know you're out here for a while i've been out here 17 years and now my friends are directors now my friends are big time dps now my friends are producing feature films and so you know we're, we're always checking in with each other what are you doing what are you up to and yeah you know i'm letting them know like i am no longer doing that stuff and now I'm pushing I'm going more towards narrative feature work and they're like oh that's interesting you know do you have a demo reel or what have you worked on and so it's not like I'm out there dropping resumes off to people I don't know because I know I would never get considered for that yeah um, so yeah I'm just letting my my base of connections know what I'm up to like a good example is when the director of that Burning Man project approached me he wanted to train me up to be a rig tech He's like, I'm, I'm coming back to America with all this information that I've learned, all, all these skills I've acquired in Europe, and I'm coming with my full package of like seven reds and all these 3D packages. I, I think, you know, it'd be very lucrative for you, and I think it'd be a good thing for you to learn to be a rig tech. And I'm like, you know, I really appreciate that, and I know it's a good opportunity, but that's not what I want to do. Yeah. And so it was that thing that we were talking about earlier about saying no. I mean, it wasn't like a hard no. It was just, I should tell my buddy I'm not really doing that. No, but that rabbit hole ends up being, you know, then another 17 years go by and you're the best rig tech in the world and you haven't done yeah. what you wanted to do. Yeah, it's like, you know, you have to say no to certain genres. Like if I said yes to reality, I'd, I'd go down that for 10 years. Yeah. And so I, that's lucrative because you can book that for six weeks, three months at a time. And I've been offered big, big shows that we all know by name, but I just, it's, I just have to resist that temptation. Um, because I don't think ultimately, physically, I could do it. Because it's all, it's really demanding on your body, and I just don't think that's my cup of tea. I think um, I'm going to see what happens. It's like I said, it's an experiment. We'll see where it leads. Great. Well, I think that's a great place to uh, leave it. Um, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you or see any of your work? You just go to my website, which is alphasonic.net. Yeah, A L P H A S O N I C. Great. Cool. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so that was Bill Totolo. Thanks for coming out, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. I know you will not be embarrassed by that. 
I don't know you well enough to know if you won't be embarrassed, but you know, I, I, hope, I, you're, I hope you're not embarrassed by that. You, you, I, I think I, you were great. I think I know you well enough to know that I don't care if you're embarrassed. <laughs> you knew what you were saying. You did. And, and you, you don't take it all back. <laughs> so, uh, Ilya, uh, introduce today's uh, war story. Today's war story is by Roberto Schaefer, uh, perhaps best known for his work on Finding Neverland, uh, Quantum of Solace, God, uh, The Kite Runner. This guy's done, a, 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 I don't know how many movies, but a lot of really beautiful movies. Got a, a lot of attention over the years. Yeah, yeah. He was brilliant. It was cool. We actually went to his house and interviewed him uh, a few months ago. And uh, here is his war story. And now, war stories. We're shooting one of the final scenes of Quanto of Solace in Bacadano, Chile, where Camille and James are in his Ford Edge, driving past the little cemetery where her relatives are buried. They've killed the general and everything's basically cool, but he still has demons. They're having this really, really like intense discussion inside the car, and we have a technocrane, we're pushing into this closer through the windshield and two cameras rolling for singles through the windows. And suddenly we start hearing all this squawking on the walkies that are coming through. And the walkies are supposed to be turned off while we're shooting, but the squawking is, you hear AD voices going, stop that car, stop that car, stop that car. And they're yelling in Spanish and they're yelling in English. And, um, and we look up the hill while we're shooting and I see that there's this Jeep careening wildly down this dirt road. And it just keeps coming and they, somebody jumps in front of it and the guy just goes, goes right through the person, knocks them over and they go out away at the last second. And the car pulls to a stop right in front of A camera and halfway through B camera. And the guy jumps out of the car and slams the door and starts screaming and saying, you've got to stop, shut down, you're shut down, you can't shoot here, this is, this is my property, you can't be here. And it turns out it was the mayor of the town who decided that he was either going to extort for more money because we all had our permits and everything, or he was just trying to make a statement for his people because he's running for re-election. But he's stamping and thing, and, and Daniel's sitting in the car looking like, what the hell is going on? And Olga's kind of like completely confused, and Mark and I and everybody are looking at each other, and the cameras are still rolling. And, uh, and then the police cars pull up. And they arrest the mayor <laughs> because he had no right to do that. And we had permits and the police said, Mr. Mayor, coming with us in Spanish and put him in handcuffs and took him off to the local Huskow. And then 15 minutes later, we continued filming and finished the scene. And I have the newspaper from the next day from the Bacadano Daily News or whatever it's called with a picture of the mayor getting arrested for stopping the James Bond movie from filming in his town. It was pretty funny. And now, short ends. All right, that was Roberto Schaefer. Thank you, Roberto. Very much looking forward to your interview in our next episode. Yep, I'm a good way through editing that one. All right. So, Ben, it is that time again where you've reached in the show where we talk about our obsession of the week, our short end, as it were. What is your short end this week? Okay, so I can't really decide. I have three things I'd really like to talk about. Could I? Can I? Do you mind if I do three abbreviated ones? Wow. Okay. If you if you can it, do if you can keep them abbreviated, then sure. It's been so long since yeah. we've blast through them. Okay. So number one is another podcast. It's called, you must remember this. It's a podcast about the first 100 years of uh, Hollywood history by a woman named Karina Longworth. And I'm fucking addicted to this podcast and I cannot wait for a new episode to come out right now. They're doing uh, a series on uh, the blacklist and every, every week is like an, a different blacklist story. Uh, m my point of entry uh, which will be of no surprise to you was she did a 12 part series called Charles Manson's Hollywood. And, and it was riveting. It was the best telling of the Manson story I've ever, I've ever heard. Um, because it wasn't, it was about Charles Manson, but it was really about like what Hollywood was like circa 1967 through 1971. It sounds like you have really good memory of this too. So you must remember this is really like it is working for you. you. Yeah, I mean, it's like, did did you just listen to this, or have you been listening to it for a while? Uh, I started listening to it. I want to say in like November or wow. December. Okay, so. And the first thing I I listened to was that. And and the Charles Manson's Hollywood thing. Of course, it's morbid as hell because it's Charles Manson. 
Um, but, uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't stop listening. I binged my whole way through it, but then like going, like she did another series called MGM stories that was like, yeah, well, the, the new movie, uh, hail Caesar is, is about, uh, Eddie Mannix mm. and she did an episode on the real Eddie Mannix, who was a terrible, horrible, deplorable, terrible person. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I can't recommend this highly enough. Her spin on, on the retelling of the history kind of through a much more modern lens. The next thing I want to hit on my short end is a thing called the iDirect. Uh, it's a device. I was hired recently to make three documentary projects uh, in which the client wanted the interview subjects looking directly into the camera. And that made me think immediately of Errol Morris and his Interotron, where he basically hooks up two teleprompters to each other so that when the person's being interviewed, they see Errol Morris's face on uh, the teleprompter. Uh, that is expensive and cumbersome and a pain in the ass. So somebody made this thing that's basically uh, one teleprompter turned on its side with a little mirror rig. So so the, uh, the interviewer sits next to the cameraman, looks into a mirror, and the person being interviewed looks right into your eyes during the whole interview. And uh, it's it's a little big, but it also works as an actual teleprompter with an iPad. And there's a number of iPad apps you can buy. Um, so did you use this? I used the crap out of it. Not only did I use it, but, uh, I'll admit this here. Uh, I uh, found it at a rental house here in LA. And then after we had, uh, booked it, I was like, Hmm, I wonder if one of these is for sale on eBay. And i you bought it. I bought it. And basically I set the price at what we were renting it for. So for the cost of shipping, I was able to, to basically swap it out. We had to rent it for one day because of uh, bad weather. Wow. Okay. On, on the shipping day. So do you think this is something that hot rod cameras should start stocking? Uh, you know, it's funny cause I, I saw one of these suckers at a trade show maybe five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's cool, but I'll never use it. And it's one of those things that now that I've used it, I love it. And I, and I had a really good experience with it and I'll probably use it again and I'll certainly use it as a teleprompter. But I do think that my attitude towards all tools is buy them when you need them. Don't buy them when you get excited about them. Like like you just did. <laughs> I bought it. I bought it when I needed it. Yeah, you bought it when you needed it. But yeah. you also seem rather excited about it. Excited enough to make it a short end. So. No, I think it's a really cool doodad. And, uh, you know, there when when editing when when editing stuff where people are looking right into the lens, there's like a really weird personal feeling about it. Like they're looking into your eyes. And I've actually thought I was thinking about it while we were working with it. That every once in a while, not all the time, but I'll do the Jonathan Demi trick when I'm directing a dramatic scene where I'll have the actors look right into the lens and, you know, they're imagining their scene partner in the lens. But I was like, hmm, I could bring this sucker out, put it on the camera, have their scene partner standing right there and they could be getting an eye line out of the actual uh, scene partner. And, and I'm going to try it and not just having to, to, to imagine and not yet, yeah, yeah. not having to make believe, but actually, you know, because I think that you'll get like a more spontaneous performance out of them if they're reacting off of someone. So the third short end that I have, sorry that it's three. Um, the, the third short end that I have is the morph dissolve in the new Adobe premiere, which also came in very handy on this documentary. Wait a second. Morph dissolve. Is this like 1980s Michael Jackson, black or white? morphing? <laughs> okay. So, so here's what happened on this, on this documentary project. We shot the front, the thing where the, uh, the interview subjects are looking right into the lens. And then, um, the DP and I set because, because the client wanted it to be so, um, eccentric that's an eccentric choice it's not outrageous but it's a little little out of the box we were like well let's get a second angle because we had two of the same camera we were just shooting it on the canon 5d and uh and so we're like okay well let's put that one like almost at a 90 degree angle getting like almost a straight profile and i thought it was gorgeous and on the day when we were shooting the client would look at it on the monitor they loved it then when they saw it in the cut didn't love it so much and they didn't say that we couldn't use it. They said, use it as sparingly as humanly possible. Hmm. So I had never had a reason to use this morph dissolve that Premiere put in this year. Um, but in this case, it was like a lot of times I'm just cutting somebody's big pregnant paws out or something and I need a second angle to cut to. And so just as an experiment, I was like, let me try this morph dissolve. And it doesn't work all the time. And, and it'll never work if your audio doesn't sound right. Like mm. it can't, it's not going to fix your audio. And if your audio even sounds like you Frankenbited it a little bit, it's not going to work. But when it does work, 
it made me feel like I will be burned as a witch because because I feel like I could make any I could if I have a stationary shot of you, I could make you say anything. Wow. Oh, so it's it's really specifically then for for that purpose. Well, Adobe, I think, has this technology that they use where it's like facial detection. So it's like saying, like, these are the eyes. Here's the nose. Here's the mouth. And, and it's doing a morph. And it's it's got to be subtle. It, again, it doesn't work all the time. And also there's like currently no way uh, for the operator to tinker under the hood with it and say, no, no, these are the eyes or, you know, they raise their hand here. Don't morph it that much. Yeah, you can't. But <laughs> we used it a lot. Hmm. And uh, and I feel like if you were to watch it, the only way that you could really tell that we did would be if you listen to the audio and you're like, it sounds like there's a cut there, but I don't see a cut. Well, that's probably when we did the morph cut. Cool. So uh, what what is your short end now that I've monop- monopolized monopolized uh, 45 minutes of, of, of yak in here? <laughs> uh, my short end this week, I guess it's a little bit it's a little bit broad, but I have to say that, you know, there's there were some really great movies this year. There's some wonderful Oscar nominated movies, but the movies are having a really hard time keeping up with television. Yeah. I'm watching some incredibly great television and television of all different genres. Uh, Better Call Saul's just returned. Yeah, it's on it's, tonight. It's, it's wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to watch it when I go home. Love it. Uh, I saw a the first episode, the pilot of a new series on Hulu uh, called Superstore. I don't know if you've seen this, but Superstore. No. Uh, the pilot was directed by Ruben Fleischer, who, of course, did uh, Zombieland and... Uh, Gangster Squad and a bunch of things. Oh, cool. It's actually shot by a uh, very talented cinematographer named Damien Acevedo. Uh, I've known Damien, God, maybe 20 years now. It's been a long time. But uh, anyway, the uh, the show looks great. And it's another perfect example. I know I mentioned Don McAlpine earlier in this the same episode, but like he shot a movie called Career Opportunities. And it's really difficult. Career opportunities. Oh, yes. Career opportunities. You remember career opportunities? <laughs> of course Frank I do. Frank Whaley. Yeah. Jennifer Connelly. It's a classic movie. And and, and I got to say that. Isn't Dermot Mulroney in that? Dermot Mulroney's in that, too. It's exactly. like him and his brother, I think, are both in that movie. Oh, I didn't know that was his brother. But yeah. I, th- I think I, th- I think so. It, well, here's the thing. It's really difficult to make like a superstore or like a Target interesting to look at it's i mean like to i mean a supermarket is a totally different thing because obviously that's where you would set a horror movie go on of course and and ben brings this up because of course he set a horror movie in a supermarket my student film also took place in a supermarket but uh, there's something about lighting inside like these you know fluorescent light you know just these giants what seem like very flat very boring spaces and making it interesting and doing a good job anyway i i thought Superstore was great. Uh, and I also watched, uh, and this is completely 180 degrees, not at all like Superstore, but television right now is so good. My my short end is television. I kind of feel like, boy, there's all this great, there's all this great these great it's, movies, but really... It's this new invention called television. I, and, and here's the thing. In, in television, I'm including all the streaming services because, frankly, Hulu's a television network. Oh, yeah. You know, Netflix is. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff happening, but uh, I watched the new... Uh, the Stephen King series, 11, 22, 63. That was actually at Sundance a couple of weeks ago. They did a special screening there and it totally deserved to be. It's amazing. It's a really, really did you see the whole series? Did no. they, did they put the whole series up? Is it bingeable or are they it doing not it bingeable? Week by week? No, it's week by week. They're on episode two right now, but it's fantastic. And I don't, it's so great. I don't want to tell you anything about it. So you can just have the experience that I had. Well, I do have Hulu plus. I'll check it out. All right. Well, yeah, it's, it's, you know, another, another great TV series this, uh, this year was Ash versus evil dead. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I, I haven't, but that it's probably binge worthy now. I Holy so. shit. That. Okay. As a giant evil dead fan, uh, they hit usually when you go back to the person who invented, who created a, a character. Sam Raimi? Yeah, Sam, so Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell, it's like the whole same team that created the Evil Dead in mm. in the in the seventies mm. have come back All to right. do it because they because they released that reboot of the Evil Dead movie franchise like two three years ago and it did really well. But the I I saw an interview with Bruce Campbell. He's like, but the fans wanted Ash, they wanted him, and um and they brought it back and they hit the exact sweet spot of the tone for that series. It's like really funny and really gross. Mm. <laughs> and 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 so pitch perfect. You know, it's interesting actually to come up on the for us to discuss it on the same episode as uh, Fury Road, mm-hmm. because I feel like in both instances you brought back the creator of a famous franchise and they outdid themselves. Yeah, that that's really true. It's like Fury Road is so good. I mean, it's so good. I, I haven't gone back and watched any of the Road Warrior movies 
since seeing Fury Road, and actually, I'm not sure I want to. Fury Road is, as I feel like, is spectacular. And, yeah, I, I'm. It's it's an underdog right now for the Oscars, but I don't you know, think I'm, I don't think it's going to win. And I and I feel bad about that because I feel like George Miller is going to kind of go down somewhat un, underappreciated as a filmmaker. But you know, it, it, every once in a while it happens. No one picked The English Patient. The English Patient won. So Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Silence of the Lambs swept the Oscars. Marissa Tomei. So you know, there's, <laughs> lot, there's lots of underdogs that like you know come out and like boom, yeah. and then they win, and it's 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 a big deal. So you know, fingers crossed. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I don't know. Excellent. Well, uh, that about wraps us up for uh, this episode of the Cinematography Podcast. Come back really soon. We'll have Roberto Schaefer up. Yeah, and uh, also keep uh, checking back uh, with your iTunes and to our now our, our new home of the Cinematography Podcast, camnoir.com. And uh, where can people find you? They can also find me at Hot Rod Cameras, and which is hotrodcameras.com, which is a store. But, you know, you can you can find me there. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook at Hot Rod Cameras, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Hot Rod Cameras. You can also just go to Hot Rod Cameras, knock on the door, and Ilya will buy you lunch. He's promising right here. I'm just, he's nodding while I'm saying it. No. He will buy you lunch. What you can't see is that Ben just put his hand over my mouth. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, someone will get lunch. One person who shows up and asks for lunch will get it. That's good. All music on our episode is composed and created by Kays Alatracci. Go to musicbykays.com and uh, hire Kays to score your next movie. And one other thing, we'd like to hear from you guys. If you're listening to the show, please send us an email, drop us a line, let us know who you are and what you like. What's the email account? Uh, Email at camnoir.com. Our new home on the web, camnoir. So email at camnoir.com. Absolutely. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you, or you will hear us next time (laughs) at the Cinematography (laughs) Podcast. (laughs) This has been the Cinematography Podcast. Presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Listener.